This uh, meeting is a follow-up from a meeting that, uh, uh, a talk that I gave at a homeschool meeting a few months ago. So we didn't actually do a lot of uh, homeschooling talking because there were some themes that I felt were very important for all of the people in this neighborhood to understand and think about. So um, recently, not an incident, just a, a question in Tarabia came up. And that question, the answers given to that question, I thought would be a very good example to help explain something that we're trying to convey to you and people are not getting very well. Some people are starting to pick it up and others are not. And uh, so I wanted to uh, have this talk. I talked to Um Khair and said, you know, that incident that happened, I thought it would be a good basis to illustrate this matter of the tabi of the children that we're trying to convey. So there are some of the, we, this uh, previous talk was actually recorded, but given that most people may not have had the opportunity to listen to it, and uh, also as they say in Arabic, uh, there's benefit in repeating things, that I will give a summary of what was the content of our last talk. So um, I'm going to, I have a, I actually have the same piece of paper which I gave to somebody and I came back to my house and it crumpled up. These, uh, this is, you have to, this is the mother of this child, if you could just keep her with you. So, the, uh, I quoted a hadith last time that uh, we came together and that was مَنْ لَمْ يَشْكُرْ الْقَلِيلِ لَمْ يَشْكُرْ الْكَثِيرِ Whoever is not grateful for a little is not grateful for a lot, for plenty. Woman lam yashkur al-nas, lam yashkur Allah. And whoever is not grateful to people is not grateful to Allah. Wa tahaddath bin ni'matillahi shukr. And to speak of the blessings of Allah Most High is gratitude, it's shukr. And wa tarkahu kufrun. And leaving the speaking of the blessings of Allah is ingratitude. It doesn't mean kufr in terms of belief. Well, jama'a rahmah, the group is a mercy and well, fulkusu adab and being separated and divided is, an, is a torment. It's an adab. This hadith has a number of things in it that are related to our talk but the reason that uh, I brought it was that in order to convey the points that I needed to convey in the talk, I <coughs> had to mention some of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on myself, on my husband, and Um Khair and Sheikh Ashraf. And I, I definitely wanted to convey that that was only from the aspect of mentioning the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us. Not that we have any superiority over anyone, but the reason that in some areas, uh, one of the things that were brought up in our last talk is that the advice that we're giving you in relation to the children is not often <coughs> being taken seriously because we don't have children. So I had to mention to people <coughs> that for a lot of the people coming from the West, uh, you live in a society where you don't grow up with children. You live in a, I lived like this because this is how I experienced my life while I was growing up in New Zealand. Is my brothers were close in age to me, a couple of years difference. Either way, I was, I'm in the middle, and uh, we grew up with children our own age or similar, close, and. So we went through our whole life, we went to our primary or elementary school, we went to high school and we went to, uh, uh, after our school, we were always with people who were close in our age. And we didn't actually grow up with babies and small children. However, uh, uh, I left uh, New Zealand at a very young age, I was 19, and I've spent the last uh, 
in over 26 years in living in four different countries. So I lived in, I spent some time in five different countries with my family in Kosovo. And with, uh, I lived in Turkey for a year and a half and I lived in Egypt for three years. And I've lived in this country for the last 22 years. And from the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us, that our experience of coming into the Muslim lands was one of being totally divorced from our Western culture and background. And my first sheikh, who was very uh, strict and disciplined, did not allow us even to visit. So there was a 10 year, 12 year period where we did not even go back and intermix with them. So the only Western person I had was association with in those years was Um Khayr, because we met in Egypt and we lived together in one room in a dormitory. So and him that uh, our exposure, uh, our, we were very disconnected from the ideas and cultural norms that we had grown up with to the extent that like something that y your, your thoughts in your mind and the patterns that you have in your mind they go round and round and round and round and you base your life on the repetition of uh, the models that you see those thought patterns and that criteria was eventually wiped out and so we lived in a number of different countries and we travel to many countries and as a woman I have been in many people's homes and seen the inside of the <coughs> homes and the way their children are and the way the people are behaved and in the last 10 years the specialty of our business has been the NAS <laughs> dealing with the NAS and <coughs> children are little NAS so the accumulation of that is that we have more life experience than you do and in general, in general we have more Islamic knowledge than you do. So, and that is like astaghfirullah, it's not, uh, it has nothing to do with uh, saying ana, it's not, it, this is tahabbath bin yamatillah. And I have no other way to explain this issue without doing that. <coughs> So the common, what we summed up in our last talk was that we have here in this community a extremely wonderful opportunity and that is to raise a generation of Muslims who are constantly consolidated in their Islam. They have no other world view. I mean, if they go out of the neighborhood, they see some things, but they, they're so overwhelmed with their Islamic worldview <coughs> that even the things that they see, if they make a trip back to England or a trip back to Canada or, or they go outside of the hay, it's wiped out quickly because they're reconsolidated. They go to school and they hear about a long the school. They go to their friends. There's no TV and their friends for the most part are exposed to the same Islamic output as themselves. They come to the Zawi, they go to the mosque, they have parties, they do a lot of activities and they're always reminded over and over and over and over and over again every single day that they are Muslim and that they believe in Allah Muslim and that they should be living for Islam. However, the observation that we have made over that we want to convey to you is that this opportunity is being wasted and uh, to a large degree. And a part of that reason is that a lot of people have come here from the West and they're still very deeply tied into those cultural norms and they're projecting them here and in the tarbiya of the children without realizing it. And they're depending on literature that 
comes from people who do not think like we do. And so, and they're taking advice and models and patterns to follow from those people. And there's no way that the way that uh, a lot of Tarabiya books present, there is some practical information that is shared <coughs> in all human experience across the board. But there are a lot of findings there that you are not seeing because you haven't had enough of a disconnection from those Western norms. So, uh, as we pointed out in the last talk, the uh, average Western family now has only one or two children. So, literature that comes out of a society that does not believe in Allah in the last day, where they do not have children anymore, is often focused around developing the nest of that child and indulging the child. And that's what we see happening here, is that we have indulged children. And indulged people are not people who sacrifice. This is the problem. And uh, we touched on this last time, this is the main point that we want to expand on here, is that this Ummah is an Ummah Mubaraka, Ummah Muhammad. And this Ummah will never be overcome. And this Ummah will have continuity. And so there have been times when this Ummah has ruled the world. And there have been times when this Ummah has been punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and has been uh, overcome by non-Muslims and which is similar to the time in which we live. But there's always a continuity of Salihin, Ulama, Mujahideen, Zakirin, Arifin who carry this, de this deen forward to the next generation. All of you people here, for the most part, have taken my husband as your sheikh. So I have been married to Sheikh for 22 years. So I can uh, confirm for you that what you perceive as a Rajal Sadiq, a person who is a man who is true, that's how he is in his home also. There's no difference between the shaykhan you see on the outside and the shaykhan that you see on the inside. He's a Rajul Sadiq with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 24-7. So when we were married, I, I'd like to share some of these things with you because uh, I want you to be able to think about them. We came perhaps from a different generation than yourself. We came from the West jaded and our hearts uh, uh, in pain because of our disconnection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ana and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ana blessed us by joining us with Ahlullah so uh, Um Khair and myself and Sheikh Ashraf we had the tarbiyah of Sultan Baba our Turkish Sheikh for a period of myself for nine years and for them for eight years when we took our, uh, our tariq and we came to learn our deen, uh, we, this matter was our whole life. We made it our whole life. And we continue to do that even to this day. So I observed Sheikh Nui has a, a lot more stamina than myself. And over the 22 years, I watched someone even from the very first that we were married at, you know, it's like we're not interested in an indulgent honeymoon. It's like we had a we had a job to get done here, and so from the very first of our marriage, we were bang on with everything that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala had blessed us to be able to do. And so I watched him over six years work every day, late into the night, and finish and just start it. And then all the other works that he did besides that, and then continue with his work after Sheikh Abdul Rahman gave him the Java and spreading the tariq. So, 
all of you have seen the fruit and the benefit of that effort of that individual person. So we know now at this point that thousands of people have benefited from Sheikh Mullah's efforts. Thousands, literally. Not just in the Tarifa, but outside of it also. If there are five people with this kind of himna and this kind of dedication, how many people will be affected? If there are ten people like this, what will happen? If there are fifty people like this, you could actually, without any exaggeration, change the world. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, this situation that we live in, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can change it in a moment. But it's the sin of Allah in the uh, cone, in the universe, that He changes things by the sift and ikhlas of people. So when those people are there, the tawfiq comes down. So how is it that a, a few thousand, and in other, there weren't a lot of people in the Arabian Peninsula at the time of the Prophet Ali Hussain to sit down. Thousands, a few thousands of people came out of the Arabian Peninsula and the Rabia bin Amr who confronted Rustam, the uh, uh, Persian general at Qadisiyya, he, he, his cloth was held on his head by a rope. They, 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 they had to have clothes to wear. And these people conquered the world. They literally conquered the world. Within two generations, Islam was the government from the borders of China to uh, France. The Muslims, the Riviera actually used to be ruled by the Sharia. Riviera in France used to be Muslim and right across to the Atlantic Ocean. And just two generations of people. So here we are, we have an, a very unique opportunity. But the problem is <coughs> these children, we have noticed, are being indulged. So an indulged child is not going to change the world. An adult child is not going to change the world. So, what do I mean by being indulged? So, I'll give you this example <coughs> that came up. It's a very simple, small thing, and we, we want to look at this example and, and look at the ramifications of it and develop it a little bit. So, uh, Um Hassan, who's uh, running the school at uh, Rehan, came to Um Khair. Her son, Hassan, is three years old. So the matter came up, the discussion was, should a three-year-old be asked, what do you want to eat? Okay. Do you ask a three-year-old, what would you like to eat? So uh, uh, Umkhaya said, no, you don't ask them what you want to eat. So <coughs> then the husband asked her, well, if there's soup and salad, and he says, I want salad, do you give him the salad? And she said, yes. So she told me this, and I said, yeah, that's absolutely right. You don't ask them what he wants. And if he asks, if he asks for the salad because it's there, give him the salad. So this was conveyed to someone else in the neighborhood, I don't know who it is. And they said, no, we made a mistake, that's wrong. And uh, you should ask the three-year-old child, what would he like to eat? So let's look at the example of asking the three-year-old child first, what would you like to eat? This is just a simple example, but this is an example of many other types of tarbiya issues happening with the children. Okay, does a three-year-old child know what is good for him? Can he distinguish between good and bad? The question might be said, a three-year-old child, if you ask him, then you're helping him. This is what I assume. No one told me this, but I'm saying, okay, well, why would someone say that that is the right thing to do? So I would assume that 
the right it would be the right thing to do from the perspective that you're helping to develop the uh, personality of that child to be independent at a young age you're teaching him to think for himself and to be able to differentiate between things and to choose and you're showing the child respect as a, a small little person that he has the right to choose okay. I would tell you the other side of asking a three year old child what would you like to eat first of all the child doesn't know what's good for him so you teach him at a young age that you have what you want that's the first thing that you teach him you teach him that what you want is what you get if you are thinking of life in a society where people live as individuals that's not so bad so you want something in life you go out and get it make an effort for it where people live as individuals but if you're looking at the way Muslims live in very large families that's not the way Muslims it's not a good quality that what I want I get and what about everybody else the, uh, uh, there are a number of other things related to what you're cultivating in that child you teach the child by constantly giving it choices at a very young age when he's not able to distinguish that to have dissatisfaction that he has to have what he wants and qana'a contentment there's a saying in Arabic that contentment is a treasure that never uh, uh, it never runs out and one, uh, something that all of us that should know that have been raised in the West and this is uh, you know, not exempt from it myself but one of our most common problems in dealing with the uh, problems of the nafs is contentment how many people are so discontent I didn't get the perfect wife I haven't got the right house I haven't got enough money I'm not doing what I want to do with my time I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not this, I'm not that and constant discontentment because you've been raised all the time to have what you want and if you don't have what you want you don't have any uh, self-satisfaction or contentment also what you do by doing that is that you teach the child at a very young age that he doesn't have to follow orders or to follow authority so when the mother comes into a child who's three years old who can't distinguish what is good for them and says eat your food the child learns this is what's on the table this is what you get to eat Alhamdulillah we have something to eat so he learns shukr and he learns some contentment but he also learns that there's someone <coughs> who has authority over him and he has to obey and a lot of success in life is understanding that there is authority and Islam is very much based on authority we have initially the authority to the Khalifa, uh, Khalifa and the authority to the representative of the Khalifa the Sahaba did not agree <coughs> with a lot of the government that was appearing while they were still alive some of them that lived to see the fitting but the majority of them accepted it because of the chaos that ensued from lack of uh, adherence to authority so we have uh, obedience to parents we have a wife's obedience to her husband so there are a lot of levels of submitting to authority in this thing and children who don't learn that they have problems in their life they have problems in their life so a child who, let's assume if we have a normal Muslim family where we have several children and we have several children and the mother asking several children what do you want to eat and what do you want to eat and what do you want to eat and what do you want to eat as opposed to a family that sits down that has a mother and father maybe a grandparent and several children 
And this is our dinner for today. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So the children, they learn to have contentment. They learn to accept what is there. They, learn, they should learn to appreciate that other people provided that for them and it took work to bring it there so they can't be fussy over what they did. And the larger uh, implication is that those children that the self is constantly focused on, they don't have any sacrifice when they get older. They don't have any sacrifice when they get older. They don't have any endurance when they get older and they don't have any perseverance when they get older. As the child becomes older and he asks you, can, I have, can we have this to eat? If it's, it's easy to do, of course, why not? When they can differentiate. So this is just a small point, but what you're doing, if you're taking a lot of this literature and these ideas that come from an alien society, an alien civilization, you will produce adult people. You're cultivating something in that child from a very young age. You're cultivating something. You're, you're putting values in the child at a very young age and they develop and stay there, those values. So what are the values that we want to have as Muslims? We don't want to be selfish, we want to be unselfish. We want to prefer others to ourselves. We want to be able to make a sacrifice for Allah wa Rasulullah to the utmost of our ability. We want to live for Islam. So you need people who have very good akhlaq and uh, uh, a lot of stamina to be able to do that. Just uh, y yesterday I was talking to a couple of sisters about the general content of what we were going to do in this talk. And one of the sisters, one of the concerns that a lot of the <coughs> parents have, and these are often new parents who haven't grown up with children, is that they're very f afraid of hurting their children. And they're very afraid of scarring their children. So the question came up, how do, I, how do we not scar our children if we're disciplining them? If we're setting limits for them? The, uh, my answer to her is that it's, it's in three things. That you give your children unconditional love. If they go over the limits that you have set for them, uh, they should be disciplined in whatever way that you see is appropriate. That doesn't necessarily mean that you hit them. But when they do something wrong, you let them know that you still love them. That the, the love is unconditional, but they've done something <coughs> that they should not repeat. And uh, if they do it again, they're going to face the consequences. But you love them just the same. And the second thing is that uh, you're always truthful with your children. Say what you mean and mean what you say. We're going to go, we're going. We're not going, we're not going. You're going to get this, you are going to get it. You're not going to get it, you're not going to get it. So when you uh, communicate to your children, they always know that what you say is true. So they feel a great deal of security in uh, their relationship with you. There's unconditional love and they know exactly what the limits are because you never lie to them or you never exaggerate. You tell them the truth all the time. And the third thing is that you have no double standards. There's no double standards. There is, you have an objective in your life and you're going forward to it and you want the same, your children to do the same thing. And so the same thing that you require from, you, from them, you require from yourself. So if children see there's always truth and there's no double standards and there's unconditional love, they'll accept the discipline. They won't have a problem with it at all. On the contrary, if you do not discipline your children, you scar them. I'll give you one example. It's from the fitra to love children. But if the child is badly behaved and spoiled, uh, he is unpleasant and people don't like him. So if the child is pleasant, the salihin 
show affection and care for the child and Ahlullah and the ulama and so they make dua for the child and they follow up on the child and they try to benefit the child so if you have a spoiled badly behaved child you're depriving him of a tremendous amount of khair and barakah in their lives because people won't like to be around it and with him we, uh, uh, I do advise everyone to keep these matters in mind and that you should look at the larger picture. For many of us, myself included, it's, it's, it's a long process unwinding the conditioning that you've had in a non-Islam, being immersed in totally in a non-Islamic society. The question came up about well, how does one have Islamic tarbiyah? It comes from knowing Islam. So I'll give you a few ideas on this. Is that, for example, uh, you go to somebody's house, okay, and the child wanders into the bedroom of the people or into <coughs> other rooms of the people's house. So what do you teach your child? You teach your child that you don't do that because we know in Islam what's the principle is that everyone's house has a hurma everyone's home has a hurma that you don't go into a place of an area of a person's home except the place that they take you to if a child has come, sees a, a bag and they want to look inside what do you teach it? you say no you can't do that why? because we know in Islam that people's private property has a hurma so let's just go back to the principles of the deen when your guest comes to, uh, a guest comes to your home you teach your child that you put the guest in the nicer place to sit because we know from our Prophet that we have to honor our guests when uh, older people are gathered you teach your child that they have to uh, show respect to the older people and this is one of the areas we discussed more in the last talk that is most apparent the difference between the East and West in Tarbiya. So there was an example that we gave uh, of uh, one of the brothers who was talking to another man, I don't know who the man was, and just and uh, if the person happens to be here, my apologies, and if it, inshallah no one knows who you are. Uh, one of the brothers was talking to a man at the masjid, and the man's child came, small child, and so the man turned away from the adult and put all his focus and attention on the child. And that's really bad manners. You're teaching your child that he's more important than the courtesy that should be shown to an older Muslim. So this is totally un-Islamic. The Prophet he said he is not of us who doesn't show respect to the elder person and mercy to the younger person. So, and this is, there are a number of examples of this where the baby comes into the scene and the older person is shown disrespect. And so this is why we sometimes call this the baby worship. The focus is the child because it's an amazing new thing. It came out and it, it, it it looks and it talks and it walks and it, you know, it's like, it's, it's an amazing thing. And so the focus is totally on the child. And love your children, there's no one telling you not to. But if you don't have your priorities right in raising them, Allah will turn this against you. Is uh, Abu Abdurrahman here? No, he's not. There's uh, the eye, I was going to bring it, in Kana Aba'akum, Abna'akum. It's in Surah Tawbah that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. There's a list of all the things that are beloved to people of their fathers and their sons and their tribes and their brothers and their wives and their wealth and their houses that they enjoy living in and their tijara that they're afraid that will go down. If any of these things are more beloved to us than Allah wa Rasuluhu, then wait, wait until Allah brings his matter about and Allah 
does not guide a fascinating people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to make Him our objective in life and not other than Him. And so the blessings that we have are part of the goodness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us that He wants us to enjoy but not to make a priority over Himself. So, so if you know your Islamic principles, when you're faced with a situation, what is the best thing to do with this child here in this situation? Then look at the Islamic principles, go back to them, and see, well, what, 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 is, what is the Islamic uh, principle in the matter? We'll uh, close up with a couple of just small things. There's one ayah here that I thought should be the sum of everything that we want to do here. And that is called إن الصلاة والنسك ومحيا ومات ومات لله رب العالمين لا شريك له وبذلك أمرت وأنا أول المسلمين. Say verily my prayer, my worship, my life, and my deeds are but for Allah, the Lord of all being, and uh, there is no partner. He has no partner. And this is what I have been commanded to do. And I am the first of those who submit. So this is the whole point of your life. This is the whole point of why we're here. This is the whole point why many of you made a sacrifice to come here. So you shouldn't lose that focus. And I would just like to share with you a, the last thing in this talk, a sentiment that... Uh, Shaykhun and I feel uh, at this point in our lives that uh, one uh, one thing I discussed last talk, which uh, before I say this last thing I will mention briefly because it's related and that is that this is uh, Zawiya and uh, it's the Zawiya of Shaykhun (coughs) and he came to this country almost 30 years ago and it's the result of his efforts. It's the result of his efforts. And all the people who come here and live here and associate with this Maori should respect that. They should respect that. And if you want to introduce things into your life that are contrary to the general flow and uh, precepts of this Zawiya, uh, you should understand that it's like someone who's in a boat and they want a bit more air and so they want to open up a new window in the boat. And in principle, opening up a window is a good good idea, but uh, if you have too many people opening up windows in a boat, the boat might actually sink. <laughs> so... Our uh, way that we see our lives is that we are wanting to be raised up on the Day of Judgment and to be able to say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we did everything that we could. We did everything that we were capable of doing. And I, at my own personal du'a is that I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise me up with Sultan Baba, my first Shaykh, and Shaykh Abdul Rahman, and Shaykh Nuh, and Umm Khair, and Shaykh Ashraf as one unit, as one person. Because our, uh, our objectives, uh, we've done our very, very best to carry forward all the work that we saw from Sultan Baba and Shaykh Abdul Rahman. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to this point has blessed us with a friendship for Allah for more than 20 years. And uh, so the way that Shaykhun and I personally see things at this point in our lives is that if we are granted uh, a long life, we only probably have 25 years of production left in it. Because Shaykhun will be close to 80 by that time and I will be uh, over 70. So, the way that we uh, look at things at this point in our life, I'd like to share this with you so you know where we're at 
and what we want and what we expect and uh, where we're going. So the way that we feel is like we're on the ship of Noah. <laughs> so we'll make it shake Noah instead of saying Noah. And we've got our compass set on one point and we only have a little bit of time left and we're giving everything that we have to reach that point. And that's all. And this ship, anyone who wants to be on it is welcome. You want to be on the top floor, you can be on the top floor. You want to be on the bottom floor, you can be on the bottom floor. You want to be on the middle, you can be in the middle. You can be anywhere you want. You're welcome. But you have to follow the ship's rule because otherwise the ship will sink. So you want to get off the ship? You can do that too. It's not a problem. And, you know, there's, we don't want to put, and that's part of the reason why this tabidia problem is happening here is because we don't want to put pressure on you guys. We want you to have your freedom to be able to live your own lives without us interfering with you as much as possible. But our objective is we, uh, we want to get to our destination with everything <coughs> that we can to fulfill that. Everything that we have. And we realize at this point that we don't have much time left. So, so uh, we only got a straight line. So anyone who wants to be a part of that straight line, Ahlan was Ahlan. Anyone who doesn't want to be as part of that straight line, that's right, you can get in a little boat and catch up with us sometimes. <laughs> you can do it if you like. Ahlan was Ahlan. So, anyway, um, Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put some barakah in this talk. The, uh, uh, <coughs> the matter is, you, know, you have to really think about where you're going with this tarbiyah and what you're producing. And look at it not only as uh, the enjoyment of your own child, but look at what you are doing for this ummah and what you will say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And will you be a part of of this Ummah Mubaraka that is the continuity of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. The Prophet informed us that there will be a day when Islam will be in every single house and every single tent. And there will be no kufr in the world left. And that, it doesn't come out of nothing. It will only, the continu it will happen because there's a continuity of signing in and people who are going to sacrifice everything that they have. Well, I'm doing that up lonely. What we want to do today, is I'm going to read you a summary of the three lessons that we've had from Sheikh Hassan. Because these three lessons constitute our foundation. These are introductory or you could say summary lessons of our basis. Now we, a number of people have said uh, that they want to go into some practical elements related to tarbiyah and we have talked about a few of these things just amongst ourselves about things that have come up in the neighborhood. However, what I want to do here is take these three lectures that Sheikh Hassan has given us as a core and as a, a basis that we always keep in mind as we're going along. So it's a foundation that we keep returning to and a basis that we keep returning to as we're going along. So the first dars that uh, Sheikh Hassan gave, okay, I'm just going to read it and uh, maybe sum a little bit up as I'm going along. Summary of Lecture 1. Children are a tremendous responsibility for their parents. Parents will be taken to account regarding them before Allah Most High. Al-Awlad Musliya, Imam Allah Azza wa Jal, wa sayyuhasib al-walidayn, an tarbiyatihim li awladihim. And here we have the uh, quote of the hadith, each of you is a guardian and will be asked about that he, which he was guardian over. Every child is born on the fitrah and it is his parents who make him a Jew, a Christian or a Zoroastrian. 
uh, if the parent is successful with the tarbiya of his child, he will benefit from this in the next world. So a person who is muafik, who has tawfiq and success in the raising of their child, that will be in their hisab. And he could have been a muafik and to tarbiya to walidihi, fahada fi hisabihi yawm al qiyama. Hada min baab, min ghaza, min jahza ghaziyan, faqad ghaza. This is from the matters mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ that whoever equips a fighter in the way of Allah has fought. So when you prepare someone else or a reason for someone else to do good works, you get the equal reward of that person without a decreasing in their reward in any way. So problematic aspect of that is that the opposite is also true, that if you do not give your children a good tarbiyah, you have the burden of, they are responsible once they reach puberty to make their own choices, but you have a hand in their bad choices and their bad tarbiyah. The basis of uh, when a child, and then we have the hadith, when a human being dies, his works end except for three things. One of these is a righteous child who makes dua for him. The basis of this responsibility is that the child is the property of Allah Most High. Your child does not belong to you. It belongs to Allah. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We belong to Allah Most High and is a trust with the parent. So the child is an amana with his parents. So the parents, the child has rights over the child and uh, the child has rights over his parents. The parent is responsible to care for the child when he is small and to raise him and instruct him properly as he gets older. He has rights over his child and the child has rights over him but the child does not belong to him to do with him as he pleases. Rather, he is obliged to raise him as instructed by Allah Most High. This is Allah's property, and you are obliged to bring about that tarbiyah in the way instructed by Allah. In the al-mulk lillahi azza wa jal, wa yijib alayka an turabbi hadha walad kama alamaka wa fahamaka Allah azza wa jal. It, rather, he is obliged to raise him as instructed by Allah Most High, his owner and creator. And if this is not done according to the way pleasing to Allah Most High, the parent will face that when he meets him. فَإِذَا لَمْ يُصْلِحْ فِي التَّرْبِيَةِ الْوَالِدَيْنِ فَعَلَيْهِ هَذَا الْحِسَابِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ if the parent is raising the child in a way that does not lead to him becoming a righteous Muslim, it is the obligation of other Muslims to command him to the right and forbid him to the wrong. The sum of what correct tarbiyah should produce is a righteous person in this world and the next. A parent who squanders the trust of his child will not only be taken to account on the Day of Judgment for this, but also the bad actions of his child will be held against him and continue to be recorded in his count even after death. Thus a person who has been gifted a child is required to ask, how does Allah Most High want me to raise him? The parent is responsible for raising his child as a true servant of Allah and to save him from the hellfire, just as he is responsible to feed him in this world and to save him from perishing from hunger. O oh, you who believe, save yourselves and your families from a fire whose fuel is men and rocks. Obligations of Islamic tarbiyah. The wajibat, uh, wajibat tarbiyah al-Islamiyya. Al-awwal. Give the child correct faith. And in aqidah sahiha. The child should be taught and well grounded in the basics of correct aqidah. Two, training in acts of worship. The child should be accustomed to and adherent in performing acts of worship. The child should be given the opportunity for an intellectual development and a means to worldly success. Uh, he should be taught good character and social skills. For example, knowing how to have good neighborly relations, maintain friendships, keep family ties. 
يعلم الخلق الحسنة وال what is it social skills تربية اجتماعية parents should care for the health of their child and يجب على الوالدين أن يدير بالهم على صحة الولد the child should be taught about the changes that occur when he becomes morally responsible for example lowering his gaze knowing the thick rulings relating to fluids that exit from sexual organs and how to make a correct ghusl, etc. The means of Islamic tarbiyah, wasail al-tarbiyah al-Islamiyya. Okay, before marriage, uh, that one select a righteous spouse. And yibhat al-insan an zawja or zawj salih salih. Possess knowledge of Islamic tarbiyah and yukun hunaka khalfiya for tarbiyah al-Islamiyya that one work on oneself before marriage such that one can become a good example to one's children. Otherwise, the corruption and bad character of the parent will be passed on to the child. Children are like videos, always recording the parent's actions and repeating them, good or bad. So, uh, it's of the most important factors in the whole matter of tarbiyah that you be a good example to your children. Children are very fast to pick up nifaq. They hate hypocrisy. So you have to practice what you preach. Make uh, plenty of dua even before one marries that Allah Most High will give one righteous progeny. A dua hatta qabla zawaj nabnuriya saliha. Care for other Muslim children prior to your own and perhaps Allah will make it a reason for your own children to be guided. And then, يأتني الإنسان بأولاد المسلمين حتى قبل الزواج وإن شاء الله يكون هذا سببا لأن يكون يكون هناك بركة وتوفيق في تربية أولاده هو. So that uh, and the matters of after marriage we're going to gradually cover them in our lecture. So the summary if we wanted to just condense that whole lecture into a few words, it is, your child doesn't belong to you. Your child belongs to Allah. And you are obliged to the best of your ability to uh, deliver the uh, trust that you have been entrusted with of raising a righteous Muslim. That is your obligation with these children. And it has to, it's not a matter of your choice. It's a matter of how Allah SWT has explained to us to raise our children. Now, one might say, well, there are a lot of styles of tarbiyah. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Because in reality, are there so many styles of tarbiyah? I, I, I'm going to question that. There are some different ways of implementing things, but there is one objective. فَالَاخْتِلَافِ فِي أَسْلُوبِ الْتَرْبِيَةِ فَأَنَا قُلَ اللَّهُ عَالَمْ أَنْ لَيْسَ ذَاكَ الْإِخْتِلَافِ لَأَنَّ الْمَقْصَدْ وَاحِدْ الْمَقْصَدْ وَاحِدْ فَالْتُرُقْ لِمَقْصَدْ وَاحِدْ لَيْسَ كَثِيرًا أَنْ يُوجَدْ إِخْتِلَافِ فِي الْتُرُقْ وَلَكَنْ لَيْسَ ذَاكَ I believe there are some differences in the styles of tarbiyah to reach the same objective. But if the objective is one, there are only a limited number of styles. It's not as wide a, a matter as people tend to refer to. And, and, I'm, and uh, I'm going to try and prove that point in this dars today. Bi-ibnullahi azawajah. If Allah gives me tarbiyah, if I'm, if I'm mistaken, it's okay. We're just trying to hit the mark. Inshallah. Lecture number two. Okay, so we know these children are a trust. They don't belong to us. And we're going to answer for them on the Day of Judgment before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if they turned out to be awlad salihin, then you're going to have double reward. You're not going to have double reward you're going to have the reward of all of your progeny to Yawmul Qiyamah that does Amal Saleh. That's a wonderful thing. But if these children, and you won't be responsible for the ones who come after that go astray, because you did your job. No. And 
if they are not Saleh, and you, a big reason for that is your tarbiyah, then you have to, you have to face the burden of that, the big ongoing burden of that, until Allah Alam man is raised up again. Okay, lecture number two. It's uh, number two in our sequence. <coughs> the discussion of this lecture revolves around the natural fitri inclination of love that a parent feels for a child. It is fitra that a person likes to have children in his life, the sentiment of kindness a person feels towards children in general and his own children in particular also stems from the fitra. So we say that someone who doesn't like children, you know, someone who doesn't feel any kindness or warmth or, or empathy towards children has a warped fitra. It's not natural. Any. It's uh, this uh, loving and kind feeling towards children is part of the fitra that Allah SWT created in us. The beauty of the child draws the parent, as does its dependent weakness, which stirs the emotions of mercy and kindness. The parent also sees in the child an extension of his own self, and therefore his own identity and being after his death. SubhanAllah. Uh, and I have an ayah here from Sheikh Hassan, I think it's Al-Malu al bunun Zinat al-Hayat al-Dunya, that... Uh, Wealth and children are the zina, the ornament of the life of this world. So they're the most, uh, the, the two things that are nafus are most attached to in having and holding is mal and gnu, uh, wealth and children. There is no fault in feeling this natural inclination towards one's children or the desire to have them. It is also a completeness of a man's masculinity that he is able to balance his qualities of strength with the ability to show love and mercy. Because this natural inclination towards one's children is so strong, there is no directive in the Quran for parents to care for their children. While there are many directives for children to care for their parents, the conscience may need prompting for the effort needed to see to the needs of the elderly and infirm. If you have a very old person and you have to wash them after they go to the bathroom, the nafs does not have an inclination for that. But you won't mind changing the nappies of your baby. So, this is the difference. We have an ayah here which has not been written out, but I think it is uh, mm -hmm. uh, no. This ayah that we quoted in the last lesson, Allah SWT in the Quran doesn't direct people to care for their children because it is such a strong inclination and emotion in people's hearts to care for their children. However, what does Allah Most High order people to do with their families in the Quran to protect them from the hellfire? And what else does He uh, order them to do? To pray and to have patience in the performance of the prayer. So Allah directs people to bring about those things in this world that will save them in the Akhirah which require effort and work. And they're things that are usually are not liked by the children who are being taught to do them. So what it is, thus he directs parents to teach their children manners and to raise them well to protect them and save them from the hellfire. The reason for this is that the love and affection one feels for one's children is such that one might not be able to enforce the discipline the child needs to be raised well or to deny him what he wants when giving to him is going to be detrimental to him. So this is a really key thing for us to understand. If you really love someone, you have to look at the long-term effects of your love. And make sure that, that the long-term effects of your love are not actually going to harm the one that you love. So, this is what Allah SWT has directed people to in regards to their children. Not to care and love for them because that's already there. 
but rather to save them from the hellfire, rather to teach them and make them become accustomed to the actions that they need to perform and to develop the character that they need to succeed in this life. So it's a very important point, and, it's, and that's the whole point of these lessons. This is why I want to have this lesson. I don't see, for the most part, it's very rare, the people who come here at least, that they neglect their children. So if someone is neglecting their children, we'll tell them, don't neglect your children, they have a right of you. But the problem that we see is the overlove of the children. So the children don't learn the habits and character that they need to succeed in life. And I'm going to give you some examples of this once we finish our summary. Okay, for the suburb of Hadi Muhadrat Muhammad Huna, and Ulahid and Bishikal Aam and Dinner, they said Mushkila Ahmal al Aula, but Mushkila. الدلالة الأولى تعلق بهم حتى الأولاد يكون فاقدين ال ال شو اسمه ديسيبلين نقص ديسيبلين ديسيبلين التربية بس ليس ليس مقصود التربية أن يكون عندهم قوة لي يقدروا على أنفسهم هذا لأن what is what this what does discipline mean what does discipline mean? It means that a person has the ability to make himself do things that he doesn't like. So someone who has always received what they want, it's not, only, it's not just about material things, but it's about getting their own way all the time or not being reprimanded when they should be. They will not learn how to have control over themselves. They won't have control over themselves. So they won't have control over the akhlaq and they won't have control over themselves to perform acts of worship. And they won't have control over themselves to endure the effort and work that is required to serve this ummah. They will not be able to make sacrifices for other people. So this is the reason why discipline is very important with children. Doesn't, I'm not talking about hitting kids. I'm talking about giving them limits so they don't cross over into things that are not going to be good for them when they grow up. Let's read. Love is one thing while tarbiya is another. A hub shay with tarbiya shay akhir. No. Love is the emotion of showing goodness to the beloved. However, if love becomes a reason for harm to the beloved, then it brings about the opposite result of what was intended. A child who is always given what he wants out of love doesn't have good tarbiyah and doesn't develop self-control. He doesn't learn patience or how to make an effort for himself. You know, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he sent these lectures of Sheikh Hassan because Sheikh Hassan is an alim. He's an alim. So I'm asking you, please, if you don't believe me, believe him. He's an alim and he has two families. He has two wives and I don't know how many kids. And I know that his children uh, have a very good tarbiyah. I've seen them myself. So this is an alim. And he's a God-fearing person who puts his ilm into practice. So Um Khair told me, he's blind. Uh, um Khair told me when she first went to see Sheikh Hassan, he asked, because he, he didn't, couldn't see her, so he obviously asked his wives how she dressed. So why is he asking how she dressed? Because he wants to see how she implements her deen. And he asked, does she wear gloves? And they said, no. So he asked them, hey, why don't you wear gloves? <laughs> anyway, she, whatever she said then, it's not a wajib in the Hanafi Medhab. But this is the kind of implementation that he has in his 
D. That there's, there's, the, it's about having taqwa Allah So this is what we want to return to. Everything that we want to talk about in this dars and in the future and in the past, it goes back to two things. Taqwa Allah and Hasn al Having fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and good character. That is the core of it all. And that taqwa law and husn al does not come about except through some disciplined tarbiyah. Children don't learn limits that some things are inappropriate unless they are told this is inappropriate, don't do it. That's how they learn it. From a very young age, they hear it over and over again. It's not that at seven years old, suddenly they start hearing messages. Where were you for seven years? They didn't understand anything for seven years? A little kid who's four years old, he doesn't understand what it means to give someone something? So they hear it from the time that they're conscious that something is appropriate and something is not appropriate. They don't have to be yelled at, they have to be told. When they get old enough that to do something they've been told is very inappropriate and they know that it's inappropriate, they should be disciplined. So there's a way to go about it. But the point is that the child, it's a process. If they open their eyes and they hear about a lot, and they open their eyes and they hear about Rasulullah and he said to Sanam. And so they know from the time that they are a child, the point of their life is Allah. And the way to Allah is by following Rasulullah So they learn that from the time that they are able to hear and see and understand from a very young age. And it becomes, it's repeated over and over and over and over again, the things that are appropriate and the things that are not appropriate. And so it becomes ingrained in them without them even thinking. Okay. A child who is always given what he wants out of love doesn't have good tarbiyah and doesn't develop self-control. He doesn't learn patience or how to make an effort for himself or for others for that matter. He doesn't learn how to face the challenges of life. There are a lot of challenges in life. And if you haven't seen a lot of them, just hang out. They're coming. You're going to face a lot of difficulties in life because it's just a part of the process of the incompleteness of the Hayat al dunya And people who don't have some difficulties don't develop deep character doesn't come out. He grows up soft, weak, devoid of willpower and defeated in life. This all because of the overlove of either of his parents. When this child becomes uh, adult, he is then devoid of the characteristics that would allow him to be a source of goodness in his parents' lives and they will then taste the bitterness of their indulgence. Okay. The child that is not raised with this good character doesn't know how to make any sacrifice for his parents. Whenever I mentioned to Um Khayyab, you know, how we might have seen a child abusing their parents, she always tells me it didn't come from nowhere. Those, that is a result of the tarbiyah of the parents. When you see a child that is very abusive to their parents, it comes from somewhere. There's a problem in the tarbiyah. It can be an empty hand from the parents, and this happens. Can it be a trial for the parents that they have a non-righteous child? And that is absolutely true. It can happen. But it's an exception rather than the rule. For the most part, if there has been a good tarbiyah, the children will have good tarbiyah. There may be one that is a trial for the parents, and that that uh, they someone who, that they've gone astray. But for the most part, you will find that 
there's a, a principle or a, a, a rule, a thick rule, that the matter that is rare has no ruling. And another lahuk malahu. So, any meaning, you don't take a position for something that really happens. Doesn't, doesn't, it's not taken into consideration. It's not taken into consideration. So, these trials that come about in our lives, because Allah SWT usually tests us with something very dear to us. So, it may come in one's children, but the normal cause and effect of the children being a torment in their parents' life comes from the tarbiya of the parents. Comes from the tarbiya of the parents. Of the fullness and perfection of one's love for one's children is the giving them of good tarbiya, showing concern for them by training them in good habits, preventing them from the bad and protecting them from that which will hurt them. The parent who wakes up their child for Salat al-Fajr on co the cold winter mornings is the person who is giving the genuine good to their child by teaching him the importance and necessity of the prayer. This child will grow up regarding his prayers with utmost seriousness. The person who doesn't want to make his child suffer from the cold or disturb his sleep has done his child a terrible injustice because that child may grow into adulthood missing his fajr prayer or even being lazy in other prayers. That's in our practical applications, but it's very simple. And he, by seven, order them to pray, and by ten, force them. But if they miss prayers when they're five and when they're seven, you don't hit them for you don't you don't you don't be harsh to them. But you should have done by the time they're ten, you shouldn't have to be harsh because they've had so much training about the salat that they they it's like when you and and a really important thing which we, we will come to discuss inshallah as we go along is a really success, successful tarbiya is about giving a lot of love. So when you're giving your children a lot of love and you say to them, this no, they'll accept it from you. It's not a big, wild, out of control nafs that's throwing a temper, you know, having a big temper explosion. Uh, and this is what many people do when they, they confuse discipline with anger. Discipline and anger are not there's no correlation between discipline and anger. This is discipline is directing the child to what is of its benefit, despite the fact that you don't it may be unpleasant. And the nafs, the, the, the other side of it is your out of control nafs that you've got mixed in with it because you're annoyed or you're disturbed or you're upset or you're tired or you're uh, it can't control yourself. And so you pour all of this nafs onto the child and that's what disturbs the child not the discipline so i've had women tell me i i, I smack my child and this makes my child more asabi makes them you know stressed out and angry and and less willing to cooperate i said because you then it means that you are disciplining your child with anger and the child picks that up and he feels he feels violated by that because no one wants to be oppressed and abused and, and violated. That, that feels that they've been, uh, what's the word I want? Abused. Abused. Everyone has a sense of their own self-respect and their own right of dignity, even a little child. Such a strong human emotion. So the, the so one lady she's telling me this that you know her daughter is getting more and more uh, obstreperous. <laughs> thank you. I don't even have to know the situation. I said for sure you must be having all of this wild anger and temper and ah when you're doing this. So just tell her before you discipline her. I love you. This is wrong. If you do it, I'm going to discipline you. But I still love you even though you're wrong. But if you do it, you're going to get in trouble. So the child has a very clear message. This has nothing to do with love, and there's no abuse. That action is forbidden. I do it, and something's going to happen to me. There's nothing else involved. So this lady, she started doing it, and the child was very calm after that. 
So she was able to discipline the child, and the child remained calm because there wasn't this, this monster nafs attacking it at the same time. So there's a very big difference between discipline and anger. They're not related. They're not related. You know about the praying for the age of seven? I, I don't know where I got it from, but I, was, I, I think I heard it somewhere that um, instead of telling them to pray, they should just see you and want to pray yeah, and join yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. However it happens, you know, you, you just, you know, get them little prayer outfits and you get them a little sajada <laughs> you know, and you set it up for them when you pray. And, of course, they're just imitating and they like to imitate and they know they have their own things to pray in. From a very early age, I mean, doesn't Aisha hear she pray? Yeah, she prays. How old is she? Three? Two. 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 Yeah. yeah, so and even if she's two, you get her a special little outfit and you give her her own little mispahan. She has her own little sajada. And so from the time that she can't even remember, there was prayer in her life and it had a special concern and she had her own things related to it. And so you help them to develop an attachment to the prayer. But at seven, we should get them up for every single prayer. Every single five times a day. I, mean, I, I'm not going to give that kind of practical advice because that's the, the small details that I can't tell you because I don't have children. But I would assume that by seven they should have a love for the salat. They should have an attachment to the salat. So you might initially make sure they pray their four other salats all on time. And have a fajr here and there, fajr here and there, fajr here and there, until they get used to the fajr. Mm -hmm. Because fajr is hard for children because they, mm -hmm. when children are deep in sleep, they, 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 you know, they get very disturbed when they're woken up. Mm -hmm. So it would take time to get the child used to fajr. You've got three years there to get it into fajr. So... Don't do it all in one go and then freak the poor kid out then. But, you know, see how, if you can get them praying before that, good. Okay. The person who doesn't want to make his child suffer from the cold or disturb his sleep has done his child a terrible injustice because that child may grow into adulthood missing his fudger prayer or even being lazy in other prayers. If you weren't trained as a child to pray fajr every day. But there are things that you learn as a child. They're very hard to break those habits when you when you get older. And so these habits and adab that are trained in the child at a young age become ingrained in them. It becomes ingrained. And that's why, and I want to give you examples, that you do your children a terrible injustice by letting things go that it, there's no harm in calling them to task on them. You do them an injustice by just letting a few things go. You should be training them with the things that they can comprehend continuously, without stop. So they hear it over and over and over and over and over and over again until it becomes ingrained in them and then you don't have to tell them anymore because they know. So, so anyway, it's like, you know, if you tra train your children without exception, they always have to say Bismillah rahman rahim before they eat. Okay. So these little kitties, before they could even talk, whatever they say, you know, they can't, you know, they can't even pronounce the words properly, but from the earliest age, there was no eating of food without saying Bismillah. So what happens that when the child is adult, they can't eat without saying Bismillah. They don't forget to say Bismillah. They won't be able to eat if they can't say Bismillah. It wouldn't even occur to them to not say Bismillah. Because it's been ingrained in their nafus. So if you didn't do that for your children, you have really done them an injustice. Why did you have children? Just for your own pleasure? That's the wrong attitude. We learned from our first lesson, children, having children is not for your own pleasure. It's for the sake of Allah. These children don't belong to you. They're not yours. They're Allah's. And so, 
you betrayed the trust by not teaching them these things at a very young age. So anyway, we're going to get on to some more examples of what is it that we're going to be teaching our children here. Yeah. Let us look at the following hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He said to Mu'ad, Verily I love you. So say after each obligatory prayer, O oh Allah, help me in the remembrance of you, in gratitude and perfection of the worship of you. This hadith is proof that the fruit of love is to benefit the beloved. If you have a hadith, Rasulullah said to Sayyidina Mu'ad, In me I have فنتيجة هذا الحب قال له فكن في دبر كل كل الصلاة اللهم عني على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن إبادتك Allah Most High has said, O you who believe, let not your wealth or your children distract you from the remembrance of Allah. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala created us for Him, and the greatest objective in these children is to know that they belong to Allah. We have to raise them for His sake. Teach them the adab and the akhlaq that they need to know. Okay. One loves one's children but doesn't allow that love to overtake one or take away from one's worship and uh, devotion to Allah Most High. There's another problem that the over-devotion causes the person to neglect Allah, his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that takes away from that essential role that essential role of being an example to your children what do you, what do you, what are we learning from this what is Shaykh Hassan telling us he said we have to live for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you have to teach your children by knowing you love them and you care for them and they have rights over you but you don't love them more than you love Allah. You don't give them care and devotion and affection and then abandon your worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they won't learn from you if you do that that Allah is the priority in your life. So how many women have told me that they are very slack in their uh, ibadah and in their ilm and in their majalis? Okay, we know if you have children that you're very busy, but there has to be some connection. You have the time. I see these women, it's like, okay, let's make organic food for the kids. I'm not talking about you. <laughs> let's get the best food. Let's get the best education. Let's get the natural toys. Let's get the holistic environment. Okay? Let's get the whole thing. You know? But you're so engaged with that, you didn't teach your children dhikrullahi azza wa jal. If your children had seen that you stopped your attention a little bit every day to make some devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they would have learnt something that's going to be of tremendous benefit and value for them for the rest of their life, which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the priority of your life. And if you don't teach them that, you've done them an injustice. That's what I call the baby worship. You put the baby first. Everything, 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 everything is always the child. He's learned to read when he was four. He memorized this and he does that and he eats good and he wears the cotton clothes or whatever and you know the whole thing. But he doesn't he doesn't have devotion to Allah because he never sees it. He doesn't see it. That's the most essential thing for that child. Because all of those things, you know, organic whatever it is, organic nappies, whatever it is, it's going to decompose. And so what happens? You're going to be faced with all of your devotion to Allah and nothing else. Um, what if the child has, like, was was about this, that other mummies love their child so much, they put them first, but my mummy is like that? No, then you didn't hear what I was saying. Because we never tell anyone not to love their children. On the contrary, 
you have to give your children a lot of, you have to give constant love and affection. And we said this. There has to be constant love and affection. Constant love and affection. But you place the limit for your children that you teach them Allah comes first. So when I'm going to pray, don't talk to me. So we do this from day one? From the very first, when even when they're little babies, mm-hmm. you put them next to you when you pray, and they get they know they get used to at a very young age. If you actually put them next to you and you pray, and they know they see when you're praying that you don't pick them up and you you don't attend to them, they actually know at a very young age that when you're in that praying motion, you're not going to attend to them, so they don't cry. They get used to it. But if the, the woman who's always holding and, you know, at all times, all moments, even praying, the baby is demanding of her time even when she's praying. So what is a logical thing to do is that, yes, of course, you're attending to your child all day and you're caring for it and you're loving it and you're kissing it and you're hugging it. But you have a half an hour in your day, you have your five prayers, and for example, you have half an hour in your day when you might read your Qur'an and do some awrad, and you teach all your children, when I'm doing this, I don't want anybody to talk to me. This is my time for Allah. And so they learn not to bother you at that time, and they keep that in their hearts. How many people have told me, they remember their parents' devotion to Allah. They remember their grandparents' devotion to Allah. It sticks in the mind that they see that there is, a, there is time that is devoted entirely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it takes priority. So they learn some of the most important things that they'll ever have in their life. They learn ubudiyya. They learn worship and slavehood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the most important thing that you can convey to your children. As I said, everything in these lessons returns to two things. Taqwa Allah and Husna Allah. And that comes from the Taqwa Allah. So it means having your priorities right. Your husband has a greater right over you than your children. It's one of the big reasons for unhappy families is there's too much devotion to the child and the husband feels neglected and then he starts to have a feeling of uh, the fraud and the uh, repulsion towards his children. He feels he feels this estrangement. He doesn't feel that he is honoured and loved in this family. He doesn't feel important. He just feels like he's, his job is just to fulfil the role of father for your little nest. That's all. He's not important in himself. It's a big reason for unhappy families. Anyway, okay. One loves one's children but doesn't allow that love to overtake one or take away from one's worship and devotion to Allah Most High. Allah Most High has said that children are a fitna. This is because they can take one away from performing wajibat such as jihad or from supererogatory acts of worship such as sadaqah because in the first case, one is afraid of one's loss of life for the sake of the child. Or in the second case, that the child should receive the money instead. Uh, so one must realize that one is going through a test to see how one is going to perform in the deen while responding to one's children. You have to keep the balance. One must maintain a balance of neither neglecting one's religion nor neglecting one's children. Okay. That's one of the problems we have, is that our problem here is not, as generally for the majority of cases, is not neglect of the children. It's neglect of the religion. The story of Umm Sulaim and Abu Talha shows how we should order our priorities. The place of Allah in Umm Sulaim's heart made it easier for her to accept the death of her child. SubhanAllah. The story of Sayyidina Ibrahim salam, with his own son Ismail salam, explains to us even more clearly how love for one's children doesn't take priority over the love of Allah Most High. When Allah Most High ordered him to slaughter his only son, he accepted the order and went forth to fulfill it. After he had finally been given a son in his old age, Sayyidina Ibrahim, 
كان مستعد أن يضحي بابنه الوهيب في ذاك الوقت وبعدما أوتي هذا الولد على الكبر He had already been tried once before when he was ordered to leave his son in the valley of Mecca in a place with no water nor any people. Yeah, just take him and drop him in the desert. That's it. No people, miles and miles and miles and miles away from anywhere. In a deserted valley, just rocks, no water even. Just the supplies that they had, that's it. But Sayyidina Ibrahim... Every single Nabi after Sayyidina Ibrahim was from his Zuriya, subhanAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not cheap. What you do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to come back for your benefit and for the benefit of your children and for the benefit of this Ummah because none of us live alone. Everything that benefits this Ummah is beneficial for us because we can't benefit in our deen without other people. So, if you don't have any sacrifice, you're not going to have the, the, the context for yourself or your own children. Okay. He had already been tried once before when he was ordered to leave his son in the valley of Mecca in a place with no water nor any people. <coughs> Allah Most High ordered these things of Ibrahim alayhi salam for many different reasons of wisdom of them that we be willing to sacrifice that which is most beloved to us for the sake of Allah Most High. The love and attachment to one's children should never exceed the love and attachment to Allah Most High. لا يقدم حب الأولاد على حب الله عز وجل We aren't asked to sacrifice our children as was Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, but we are asked to benefit them by guiding and teaching them. Keep that in mind. That's the whole point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just wants you to rabbi him. Mush matlub min kum anta daddahi bi awladukum. Bas rabbi him. Rabbu him. Raise them properly. Raise them properly. Okay. Someone who doesn't do this while the child is young can't then turn to his son or daughter when they are a teenager and expect them to change. If one truly loves one's children and wants the best for them, they should learn, the parents should learn, correct Islamic tarbiyah for their sake. On the day of judgment, people will not be asked about the love for their children, but they will be asked whether or not one led them to that which was good and beneficial to them. One hopes that it, one's children will be a reason for one's reward on the Day of Judgment and not a source of grief and punishment. And that one was truly able to help them reach eternal felicity. Okay, our last lecture, and uh, uh, we'll quickly read it. This lecture focuses on the importance of holding together a sound, firm and happy family life that provides the environment for the social, intellectual, psychological emotional and religious growth of the child. All aspects of his growth depend on having a happy family life. And this is one of the most absent factors even in religious families. If you don't have a good, healthy family where people respect each other, they have affection and love for one another, They go out of their way for one another. They restrain their nafs for the sake of the other people. They have good akhlaq, not just akhlaq. The, the main problem in the Muslim world is public akhlaq. My good akhlaq, I want to be known as yani, Ibn Nas. So the worst, one of the worst sicknesses in this ummah is the idea that we have Public and private behavior is different. In private, we can abuse the people we live with, we can insult them, or we can be selfish, or we can be nasty, all of this ugly akhlaq. But that's okay because we're all family and we can just, that's normal. You know, we can treat each other like that. And when we go out, we put on this, this robe of public, public, Uh, behavior so that people think that we come from a re we're really good people and we come from a really good family and so we behave you know with perfect adab and really 
you know, pinnacle of uh, good character and religious, uh, uh, you know, we have, we have lots of good religious uh, uh, behavior in front of other people. But that, that's nifak, it's a kind of nifak, it's a kind of hypocrisy. Because the Prophet wasn't like this. He had perfect akhlaq and perfect adab inside his house and outside his house. And even more so to the people of his household. So this is a this is a sickness in this ummah. This idea that you can be something else in your family. The degree, uh, the degree to which the sound family framework is preserved, is the degree to which the child experiences a good sound upbringing. The degree, uh, uh, the degree to which the family environment is preserved, is the degree to which a righteous Muslim evolves out of the child raised in it. It is for this reason that Islam has restricted all ties between a man and a woman that might result in a child who is not from those described and permitted by Islamic law. These boundaries establish and protect the family environment for the child to be raised in. It is significant that the Quran mentions adultery both before and after it mentions killing. Why? Because a child who grows up without a family, it's as if you killed it. Because you denied it a healthy and a family with which him to grow up in. So you've destroyed something of his, his personality, his identity, his social standing. So many things are destroyed in that child because he's born out of a family. And this is an indication that adultery is a form of killing and that one has destroyed something in that child's life by not giving birth to it in an honorable family that cares for and protects it. One has killed this child in a spiritual sense as it has no lineage, parents or siblings with whom to share his life. How does a child who is abandoned to an orphanage or simply left in a hospital or left at someone's door as happens in Muslim countries regard himself when he grows up in a society where everyone else belongs to a large family? It's so cruel. So cruel. And I know that I've, 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 people in Yemen, they told me they... They, a child was left at their doorstep and it died eventually and uh, I've heard many stories of children being abandoned in hospitals you know, just mother gives birth and leaves, leaves the child there it's very sad I mean, what does the child think when it grows up? how does it get married? when it goes to marry someone, how do they go and introduce themselves? I'm Ibn Adam and uh, so cool, so cool. Islam has protected children in society by not allowing relationships between men and women except through marriage. A Muslim man seeks to marry and strives to achieve the means for bringing it about because this is the only valid outlet he has for his sexual desire. And it is really interesting. I have a couple of books which I want to talk about in future lessons because they're related to our dads. That. Uh, just the insecurity that many Western women have because men can have a relationship without commitments. And so they're waiting for marriage. They're waiting for the man to marry them. And so like they get up to 35 and when am I going to have kids? And the man just doesn't feel the compulsion because he can live with this woman and he can enjoy her and he doesn't have to have a commitment. So it's actually, the, as we're going to say here, uh, he, he then enters into, okay, it's the only valid outlet he has for his sexual desires. He then enters a relationship with a commitment and an understanding of the rights he owes to his wife. This commitment and fulfillment of rights is then extended to his children. The first to suffer from sexual relationships outside of marriage are women and then their children. Because it just teaches men not to have commitment. Okay, guys, let's make a little summary for it. This is our base. We want to repeat it because we want to go back to it all the time. Because this is, this is the core from which whenever we talk about our tarbiyah, we're going to go back to this. These three lessons are the introduction and they are the basis for all of the things we're going to do in the future. The first rule is that the dominion belongs to Allah. 
These children are the property of Allah. They don't belong to anybody else. They are an amana in the hands of their parents. They are people are obliged to raise these children as sincere, God-fearing, righteous Muslims. And this tarbiyah requires that the child be restrained from something that it wants and that it be ordered to do things that it doesn't want to do. So this tarbiyah either comes by the, the that insan is salih, either comes as a result of being trained that way as a child, or it comes as a result of a very hard mujahida when you're older. Everything that you gained in, from the tarbiyah are things that you are then relieved of in training yourself when you become older. <laughs> لا ليس كثيرا هكذا محمد هو ممكن يكون المجتمع أو يكون في مشكلة في التربية أنا أقول أن في مشكلة في التربية هل الولد عرف حقيقة معنى لا أنا يعني والدينهم مشايخ علماء okay um, Muhammad is just uh, quickly say uh, she's saying about this question of that there are parents who raise their children and the children go astray. And how can we be responsible? I said, I mustn't have translated properly. If you raise your children well, and they go astray after they reach puberty, you are not responsible for them. If you raise your children well, and they, they uh, become Salih Muslims, then you have the reward for them and all of the Salih progeny to the <coughs> day of if you raise your children badly, then you will have the responsibility of the way your children turned out. Okay. So if you did your job and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't he gave you a test in this, you are absolved of any responsibility if you did your job. But I've said in Muhammad that I personally believe my Hasnadan, my good inshallah good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I hope you have a good opinion of Allah is that if you raise your children well, and what does that mean? That you give them a lot of love and affection and care. And you have a, a peaceful, loving home. And you place those limits and give those children tarbiyah from the time that they're very small. It's very, very hard for a child to go against their parents when they've been treated so well by their parents. Because it's of your fitra to have a loyalty towards your parents. So your fitra. So if someone is telling me that, but there are a lot of religious people who don't have loyalty to their children because they don't restrain themselves from their anger and their selfishness and their big nefsanic, shaitanic, uncontrolled selves. Okay, if you weren't raised that way, you don't have an excuse. You still have to restrain yourself. You have to make a big mujahida. If you don't have adab, learn it. If you don't have personal khuluq, learn it. If you don't have taqwa Allah, learn it. Don't get married until you can have personal khuluq. Don't get married until you can have adab. Because you're going to destroy yourself, your husband, and your children. It's better to not have a family. Because at least if you're going to go to the hellfire, or are you going to destroy your own life? At least you're just one person. Don't drag everybody with you. So if you want to know about, if someone tells me, if someone tells me that there is a religious family, but the children went astray, I will say there is something inside this family that is, they're keeping hidden from other people that is out of order. Either the parents have a bad marriage and bad heart towards each other, or there's something there that turned those kids away from the dean and turned them away from following the way of their parents. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about 
what Amchaya and I do when we go on our sohbas, what our line of work is. When we go to sohba, England, Australia, America, Canada, our job there is we set up a little corner, and this is called my office, okay, and we take appointments and we see people. So over three days, we see between 30 and 40, sometimes up to 50 people. Now, this sohba in Australia, I saw between 30 and 40 people. I want to share with you some of my observations and some of those observations. We've talked about these things over time. Now, what I had in Australia, the majority of families in Australia are dysfunctional families. No. People who live in Australia can tell you that. <laughs> you see most of these people in Australia come from dysfunctional families. Is that the same in other countries as well? Uh, more so in Australia. Than, and say the overwhelming cases of people in Australia, I had the generation of the children and I had the mothers coming to me too. The majority of people I came to, most common problem is these families of fighting. Families of fighting. Now, what is the really sad thing? What's the really sad thing? Is that the people who are now married, you know, they, your generation, the majority of you, are coming to me and telling me I'm behaving the same way as my parents. Even though I dislike it. Even though I dislike it. Because that is the effect of training. That is the effect of seeing something happen day after day done in a certain way. So it becomes ingrained in you. It becomes ingrained. So if you don't get tarbiya as a child, it's very hard to change as an adult. It takes a big mujahida. It takes a big mujahida. And, and these people, what was they constantly telling them? I would speak to them individually, and every day I would gather all the women together, and I'd just tell them over and over and over again, you have one life. That's all. One life. No other life. If you don't change yourself, you will never change. If you don't solve these problems, they will never get solved. And you will be like these older people who are coming to me. You'll be exactly the same. Nothing's going to change for 20 years. If you don't solve your problems, your problems do not get solved. Take it as a general principle. They will not get solved. Okay. Not only that, they will get worse. You know, there's this idea that time will solve things. It's not true. Time does one thing. It heals wounds. Yeah. It heals wounds in the heart. If you've had a broken heart, if you've, someone has died or you've been hurt, time will eventually cause you to forget you forget the pain. But it won't solve problems. You have a problem, time will not solve the problem. If you weren't raised with good tarbiyah, if you don't work hard to solve your problems and gain proper tarbiyah, you will not raise Sardahin children. You won't raise Sardahin children. Even though you've got them out memorizing the Quran and, you know, doing this and doing that, send them, teach them how to pray early, but they're going to take the bad akhlaq that you have because you didn't get rid of your bad akhlaq. They will naturally absorb it whether they like it or not. Just like you absorb the bad akhlaq of your family. And how many people have I seen that, dislike the way that their parents solve their problems. And yet, when they're in the same position, 
they find themselves automatically screaming and yelling exactly the same way because they learn over and over and over and over and over again that pattern. When you hear screaming and when you get upset, do this because that's the way you always reacted and the way you were trained while you were growing up. Now I'm going to tell you this other very sad realization that I have come up to and and I would discuss it is that except for someone who really, really is longing for a law with a sort of home and really wants to change their life, I actually unfortunately believe from seeing a number of cases now that most people, if they have a character problem in their pull never change, never get rid of it, except for the rare case. Some people, and we all change and we all improve, but unless you're really going to make an extreme effort to find out your character faults, they'll never go. And I, you know why I'm telling you this? Because I'm telling you, believe me, will lie. How many people have told me now that they're people that we've known and we're working with and they have a problem and you tell them the problem and they say, I can't see it. I don't understand what you're talking about. Amchei was dealing with someone who had a really chronic case of selfishness because they were raised as an only child and with the only child of the grandparents and they were used to their whole life getting everything for themselves. So when they became an adult, they were a dysfunctional spouse because they're only thinking of themselves all the time, all the time, all the time. And people who interact with that person, they say this person is ruthless, has no empathy for anyone, hard. And we told this person, we're trying to help them over a long period of time, you have a problem, selfishness. Well, why that person started to cry when I told them that? Why? Because they really felt that they had tried in so many cases to be, you know, unselfish. And they kept on saying, I'm generous, I'm generous, I'm not selfish, I'm generous. And the says, it's not a matter of being generous. The opposite of generous is to be cheap, bechiyan. The opposite of being selfish is to have empathy for people. They're two different things. Couldn't even see it. Tell them over and over again, this is a problem. You can't go forward on your life until you get over this. They can't see it. They can't see it. And they have to sometimes wait for a disaster in their life before they can see these things. So, this is the result of tarbiya. This is ingrained behavior. It's very hard to change. And it may never change. May never change. One person that I know is over-devoted to their child. One of these children, whenever it was, I don't want to indicate anybody, I just want to give the example. A small child came in and sat on my stairs here without a parent, without any adult, okay? And then they got up and they wanted to go walk down. There's no one around. And I was afraid this child was gonna hurt itself because it fall down the stairs, there's no one there, yeah, there. it's a small child. So I told the child, I says, okay, go out. And, and the child says, no. She says, go out. No. And <laughs> sit down, no. I was shocked. Then the parent came in and I said, your child, your child doesn't listen. And I felt that the person was uncomfortable with me saying that. And they, they just didn't look at me, didn't say anything, and they took their child and they left. What a vun to that child. What a vun. You trained out of your love for that child, you know, giving and giving always what it wants, doesn't know how to listen. Can't be told what to do. So how many things in its life 
is it not going to be able to take and understand and absorb and benefit from? First of all, it has no respect for other people. That's number one. But not just that. It's like you can't benefit a child like that. You can't explain to it things that are good for it because it's used to, if I don't like something, no. If I want something, give me. Is this the case? That tarbiya, that, that, pers- that is a person who cares very much for their children. But that is dhun. That is dhun. Your children need to know what is right and wrong from the time that they can open their eyes. From the time that they can differentiate between two things. You try to teach them the things that they can comprehend. Yes, no, good, bad. So you teach them over and over again. It's not good manners to go wandering around someone's house with food, making a mess all over the place. So you teach them in your own house. Sit down when you're eating. This is part of the adab of Islam. Sit down when you eat. Sit down when you eat. When they want to go wandering around, sit down when you eat. Sit down when you eat. Sit down when you eat. How many times do you have to say it? 200 times. Sit down when you eat. So every single time they get up to go around and eat, they're one and a half years old. That's old enough. They can understand when they're one and a half years old. Eight months. Eight months. Yeah, okay. okay. One, okay. Eight months to a year. Even if it's only so small, he's still getting the little message. Sit down when you eat. He's a little too young to give him a little tap on his hand when he's eight months old. Wait till he's over a year. See how much he can comprehend. Sit down when you eat. That child will grow up all his life sitting down when he eats. Soon as he's able to understand something, say Bismillah before you eat. Bismillah. Did you say Bismillah? Did you say Bismillah? How many times do you tell him? 200 times again. Bismillah, 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 until he gets it, Bismillah, whatever they say. And then what do you tell him? Eat with your right hand. He eats with his left hand. Habibi, eat with your right hand. Eat with your right hand. Eat with your right hand. And what? When he gets to be close to two years old, if he eats with his left hand, you smack him. Eat with your right hand. You wait until he's able to comprehend. You spend a whole year telling him, eat with your right hand. So when he's two years old, he eats with his right hand. Now, as he gets older, you teach him bigger, deeper things. Teach him Iman Billah. Teach him Taqwa Allah. Teach him Husn al Teach him how to be Kareem. Teach him how to be Wafi. Teach him how to care for people. All of the praiseworthy at Teach him how to be hospitable. Teach him how to be gracious. So, what's the criteria? What are we trying to teach them? It all comes down to taqwa Allah and Husn Khulaq. The taqwa Allah is the ahkam. You teach the children at a young age, what does Allah want you to do? And what does Allah not want you to do? So you teach them at a young age, this age here, you get them a little prayer out for them, you get them a little sajada, and you let them stand next to you when you pray. Over and over again, over and over again, over and over again, they learn that they pray every day, every day, every day, every day. What happens? We pray. You don't force them to pray until they get to seven. At seven, you start making a habit out of it. By the time they're ten years old, there's no discussion. If you've raised them with love and good tarbiyah, when you tell them, now you must pray, and I don't accept it from you that you don't pray, they will pray. Okay, guys, got the idea? Everything that we're going to do from now on is going to go back to one thing. It's going to go back to that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for Him. That's the point of everything. And if you're going to raise children to be good Muslims, first thing, try and fix yourself up. 
Because if you don't, if you didn't get that advantage of having a good Islamic tarbiyah, all of your sicknesses and all of your faults are going to be transmitted to those children, even though you're trying to give them an uh, Islamic tarbiyah. Even though you're trying to give them an Islamic tarbiyah. If you don't solve your problems, your problems don't get solved. I spent a whole three days talking to almost all of those 30 to 40 people. It was about these, this either... I'm talking to the parents who are fighting constantly with their husbands. Constant. You know, 50, 60 years old, and can't you give up? And they're still fighting, 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 fighting all day. And the people coming in saying, there's no peace in our house. Fighting, 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 fighting. And the next generation is doing the same. If, for example, you want to change yourself, but the, your spouse is not willing to change it, does it enough one person to change? It the takes other? two to tango. Mm -hmm. And it takes one person to stop tango. Mm -hmm. So it's never, it's, it's like you stop, if you're fighting, if two people are fighting, mm -hmm. and one person, you have a dynamic and you're fighting. It starts off with certain words and then it ends up, you know, go, mm -hmm. every time it goes the same pattern. You know? mm -hmm. So if you decide that you're not going to give the answer that causes the, the dynamic, mm -hmm. then the fight's not going to happen. Because there's not two people to do the tango. Mm -hmm. Ta two people takes two people to take a tango. Mm -hmm. So even for non-Muslims, you know, if they're going to talk about s solving marriage problems, what will they tell you? Mm -hmm. Is that you have to change the dynamic. Mm -hmm. You have to have. You have to now de solve problems in a different way. You have to react in a different way so you don't keep repeating the same patterns. No. Yes. What if one parent is not is not um, being on time, for you, there is a general principle in relation to spouses, husbands in particular. You can only change a man by treating him like a man, and by your own good athlop, he will eventually change. But you cannot change a man by telling him, you should do this, 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 and this. It's a general principle. If you're married to someone who has faults, you have to accept those faults, if you improve your way of dealing with that person, if you treat him in a good way that one should treat a husband, he will reciprocate better and he will generally improve himself in his religion because he knows it's something important. But a sure way to get the man to do the opposite of what you want is to follow him around and tell him, you should be doing this and you should do this and you should do this and why don't you do this and why don't you do that? And this is not good, and that is not good, and that it causes the opposite reaction in the man. He gets, he might come round in the beginning because you're nagging him so much, but then he will rebel. Okay, now, guys, we only have a few more minutes, and I want to sum this up. There has been a, a bit of discussion about how to implement this tarabiyah practically. Okay, and that's what everyone is concerned about. And I'm going to give you a means to be able to help you, we're going to discuss things practically, because we need information, but I'm going to give you a criteria that you can use yourself to measure things, inshallah. So let's say, okay, our summary is Allah created us for himself, the purpose in, in uh, uh, the children belong to Allah, you have to raise them to become Salihin Muslims, and it is of the fitrah to love them and care for them. Someone who doesn't love their children is abnormal. It's abnormal. But because uh, the love is so strong for them, it's a reason for us to forget the priorities. And the priority is Allah himself. And so therefore, the love should be balanced for what is beneficial for the children and not over love to the point that they become pathetic. The children become pathetic, and then you install in them bad akhlaq. Okay. A happy family environment is the essence of good tarbiyah. If you do not improve your own akhlaq, if you do not solve, solve your own problems, you can't be an example to your children, and you can't have the environment that will produce healthy children. You have to have a good marriage. And you have to have a good family life in order to produce good children. If you have not had these advantages in your life, 
you have not had these advantages, you have to make mujahida of your nafs to find out what your issues are. And if you hear someone telling you something, and you hear it from someone else too, like someone says you're selfish, and then another person says you're selfish, and a third person says you're selfish, you have to understand. These people are the mirror of yourself. They're telling you you're selfish because you are. So listen to what people, what Allah is putting on the tongues of people about your akhlaq. Because it is true. It's not, they're not coming together to make it up. So the worst problem for this akhlaq, ingrained bad akhlaq, is not being able to see it. Because you can go on until you die and die and nothing will change. Because you can't see it. Now, okay guys, this is not a I'll give you the ammunition to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us Sulullah and he said And what did he say in his Quran, in his revelation? He said, Laqad kana lakum fi rasulillahi uswatan hasanatan. Liman kana yarjullah wa yawm al akhir. Wa zakra Allah kafira. Okay, let's look at this ayah. Laqad, and this is, you know, there's all these ta'kidat, you know, emphasis, particles of emphasis in the Arabic here, that verily, there is for you in the Messenger of Allah a beautiful example, a perfect example, for whoever has hopes for the meeting with Allah. And we said in our other lessons that the reason for all kufr and all ghafla and all masiyah is not anticipating the meeting with Allah. You're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's going to happen soon. It's not going to, you know, this whole life is just going to feel like a day or part of a day. So, whoever wants to know what, how you're supposed to be that's going to give you every success in this world and the next, you have to look at the akhlaq and the practice of the Prophet and the So, what is the examples that we want? Did the Prophet and the get angry for his naps? No. You have to keep on looking at the akhlaq of the Prophet. When you see your children, it doesn't matter how old they are. That child who said to me, no, has obstinance, which is mukhalaf al sunnah, has disrespect, which is mukhalaf al sunnah. And it's going to be a selfish nafs, which is the of the sunnah. So this child is being raised mukhal of the sunnah. So what do you have to do when you see your children behaving in any way? You have to ask, is this from the sunnah? Is this the way the Prophet ﷺ was? So if the child, like walking around with food, is this is mukhal of the sunnah? Don't do it. The child is rude. Mukhalaf the Sunnah, don't do it. The child is bragging. Mukhalaf the Sunnah, don't do it. The child is rude. Mukhalaf the Sunnah, don't behave like that. So every time the child does something that's Mukhalaf to this Uswa Hasana, that's the measure. And it's the measure for your own self. <laughs> إنه الولد يكون عامل حاجة واضح جدا إنه مخفى ويمكن إحنا العرب أسهل بيكتشفوها بعدين يتفاجئ إنه مش عارف إنه ده مخفى زي المش آه بس قصدي ممكن إحنا كمان إذا إذا أرينا في أخلاق في في الأداب أصلاً هاي سعيدة في التربية نعم معلوم أداب الأكل أداب النوم أداب الأداب the adab knowing this is why it's important to know the adab of the prophet that he's after some adab of getting of clothing, of eating, of sleeping, of all of these adab. So what you should be, and, and it's also important to know the shama of the Prophet how he was as a person, how his akhlaq was, how he treated other people. So even in common sense, everything you know that is, even if you don't know the details of this, the adab they know, it requires knowledge. But the, the, the akhlaq, the akhlaq, a lot of it is common sense because everything that is good 
is of the Adab of Islam. Everything that is bad is not of the Adab of Islam. So, letting these things go in your children is a vun. It's a vun. It's a big vun. Because they're going to grow up not being trained in that uswa hasana. They're not going to be trained. Because all of this akhlaq is ingrained at a young age. These are patterns of behavior that are instilled in a person at a young age. And so if you have the, some people, that you didn't choose the way that you were raised. So if you were unfortunate that you didn't have parents who had good akhlaq or they weren't even Muslim or you didn't even have a parent, whatever the situation was, Someone was missing in your equation, which is very common today that there's people missing in the equation, the family equation, then you didn't have that advantage. Don't pass it on to the other kids, to the next generation. Work hard to get it out of yourself. Find out. Because it all gets transmitted. How many people joining between our dars and tasawwuf and the dars of the tarbi of the children? It's all coming out to the same thing. Because what we're dealing with in the Tasawaf are the diseases and problems of the people who were trained in a certain way as, their cho as children. And now they're trying to deprogram. And it's very, very hard. And their lives are an ongoing mess because there's so much ingrained programming. So when you have the opportunity, if you have the opportunity to raise your children Islamically, and then you indulge them, well, lie, that's vum. It's double vum. And that's one of the things that most disturbs me about this baby worship I see here in the Hague. Because it's like you've got an Islamic environment surrounded by Muslims who are practicing the deen. And you have a an, an golden opportunity to raise your children on good Islamic akhlaq. And you don't teach it to them. You teach them that they're more important. You're great, you're great, you're great, you're great, you're great, you're great, you're great. So he only thinks about how great he is. Smile on that. Doesn't work in real life. Doesn't make good Muslims. Because the good Muslim is the one who is saying, Allah is great, Allah is great, Allah is great. Allahu Akbar. And that fills his heart. He knows he's alive for Allah and he's going to return to Allah. And so he's keen on that uswa hasana that makes his life, life felicitous and everyone else's life felicitous. So we're going to read these last eyes and then we'll finish. قُلْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَحَبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبُكُمْ If you, if, if you love Allah, then follow me closely. اتَّبَعْ Ittabi'uni, this ittiba is not just following, it means to be, uh, to uh, uh, follow with a passion, to follow strongly, to do something strongly. So if you love Allah, then follow me, follow the Prophet and the and Allah will love you. So what is the following? It's two things. Taqwa Allah and Husn al khuluq Because it's following the Prophet ﷺ in the ahkam, in the halal and haram, and following him in the adab and akhlaq. So when you are a person who's on that uswa hasana, then Allah loves you. Allah loves you. Allah sent the Prophet ﷺ to show us how to be so that we can be loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we can have a successful life forever, this world and the next. And he will forgive you your sins. Overlook everything by following that example. Now, third ayah. Ya ayyuhan nabi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam by his role as the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. By his being the Nabi, that Allah sent him as a prophet to us to what? Ya ayyuhan Nabi, 
انا ارسلناك شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا الى الله باذنه والسراج المنير سبحان الله so this is our example so all you have to do is keep that example moving around in your head all the time so translate you know and oh okay يا ايها النبي او prophet ان ارسلناك verily we have sent you the royal we shahidan as one who bears witness and allah ala i think that might be related to the verse in the torah of sayyidna musa alayhi salam the mubashirat from the torah so it's the shahid allah ala wa mubashira wa giver of glad tidings wa nadira warner no. with da'iyan ila Allah and one who is calling to Allah bi idnihi by the permission of Allah most high with sirajan munira and an and uh, an effulgent lamp and a light giving and effulgent lamp so that is why a lot of this tarbiyah that's going on now is off course because it is not on that uswa hasana it's not on the uswa hasana because there's a, a focus on the development of the children but not enough on their discipline and their adab and their akhlaq so it, it was like okay if your kid knows how to read when he's four so what He's going to learn to read when he's six too. So <laughs> maybe when he's seven or eight, so what? But if he doesn't have ingrained in him taqwa Allah and husn khuluq, you have done your child a tremendous disservice because he'll be like you, like many of us, that we have to get to adulthood and struggle to change ourselves, to take and relearn so many things in our life and to bring out a khlaq and adab that we don't have and control this monster nafs that has grown out over the years what no we and as not all, it's not everybody me and woman and the whole log stuck in barrel so what we want to what we want to do I mean yeah. we are struggling to fix ourselves okay all we want to do here we don't want to sort of tell all the mothers they're no good <laughs> that's not our solution our solution is to realize what you're supposed to be doing if you know what you're supposed to be doing then you can you can you can you can put it into practice you can start working if you don't know what you're supposed to be doing it's very difficult to put things into practice because you're all over the place it's very simple it's not complicated Allah created you for himself you belong to him and everything you have belongs to him your children are in amana you have to raise them to be good muslims the way to do it follow the example of the prophet and his son and put those teachings before your own inclination give them the priority not what you prefer and then you'll get results but if you bring these you know super babies you know 8 years old and still behaving like a 3 year old yes, yes. I- i'm wondering can those of us who reached conviction about this religion and we decided to practice and we made t- you know we changed our lives at other other point we practiced this religion with certain yaqi because we chose this no. path and we can compare it with our previous life and we know that this is better for the kids who were raised in religious families so they did not see the other option of living in masna is their yaqeen as strong as those who reach that conclusion themselves if you if the children have a good tarbi a real we're talking about we're not talking about this public islam okay we're talking about real islam in their homes i've seen some really mubarak children in my life i've seen people who've grown up with with love of allah with a sort of hope because yeah yeah i've seen a and they they people with really good akhlaq the thing is that someone who has converted to Islam 
may have more himma, but it, it doesn't mean everyone who converts to Islam has that himma. That himma is the nyama from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the, the shulk that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates, this longing in the heart that the heart has for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that person, whether they were born in a Muslim family or in a, in a good one or a bad one, or they converted to Islam, they can't rest until they satiate that desire for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a ni'ama from Allah that he created in the heart of that person to seek him. But you'll find that these people who are, have been raised in these very good Muslim families, they're very, very good people. They have good adab, they have good akhlaq, they have taqwa Allah, they're kind, they're giving, they're caring. They're, you know, they, if they don't have the himma to be of the awliya, they're salihin. And they still have their own jahada, right? Of course. Like, well, it depends, you know, but, you know, you're just talking about people who, it's like, people who just haven't done haram all their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, just little, little sins, you know, they haven't done any, there's no, there's been no haram. You know, like young men who've just who've never looked at girls. They're going to have more barakah in their life than someone who's had a whole lot of girlfriends. Mm -hmm. You know, that they, that they have to start their life off without these huge mistakes and without all this damage control that has to be done. Because mm -hmm. they already know where they're going. They've already got a lot of haram out of their life. How many people who don't have that, you are talking about, Okay, let's go to your mujtama, your mujtama Masri of a certain tabaqa of English speaking, not very religious people. How many people do you know that are now going close to 30 have successful lives? How many of them have, don't have this huge amount of damage that they have to fix up because they didn't start off right? You know, divorces, children, uh, uh, just their whole... Their whole, they're, they're, they're going to reach a certain point somewhere down the line where they're either going to carry on in their own destruction or they're going to make a tauba. And so they're going to be 35 years old or 30 years old or 27 years old and they're going to start from scratch. It's a big difference. How many of them make it? How many? As opposed to a child who was given a good Islamic tarbiyah, he can't do those big harams. Even if you had the opportunity, it's like, I want to do it, but I can't, you know, because it's so ingrained. And then you think of the parents. How could I do that to my parents after they've done, how could it cause them so much pain? And even if, if they're not, if they're, if they're taqwa Allah, their, their concept of, uh, uh, of doing it for the sake of Allah is not deeply developed, they're, they're still their, their uh, sense of commitment to their parents is very deep and to their family. So, anyway, what I'm doing, I have to This is the last thing, and then we have to stop here. Sometimes, I mean, for lots of people, just talking to them doesn't work. They have to leave with the person, the chef, for example. But then they can see things. Yeah, you know, all, this is how it was one time ago. We're, no. all, we're all learning, Farhana. We're all going through a learning process. And uh, this is why I always tell everyone, be humble. Don't be arrogant. Be humble. Be willing to think that you're wrong. Be willing to listen to the advice that's given to you. Because if you're arrogant, you're just gonna you're the one who's gonna walk into the wall, nobody else. And you're still gonna walk in the wall. Some people are not aware that they're arrogant. This is a problem. We have all been and yeah, what is it? We have all been and still are in a state of ignorance. And learning is a gradual process. Many of us have come from non-Muslim backgrounds. Many have come from uh, Vafilin backgrounds, Dunyui backgrounds. And we're all trying to change. And so some people have more advantage. They've had a good tarbiya, Islamic tarbiya. Some people have not. But there is, everyone has to some degree changed. Some people will move slower. Some people will move faster. Make the matter easier for your own children that a lot of things are already clearly established for them by the time they reach puberty. So they, by the time they're 15, 16 years old, 
they're committed to their salat, they're committed to the basic akam, they've got basic good adab, they've, you know, they've got you know, basic good character that they can be successful in life. They know what it means to be sadiq, to be truthful. Say what you mean and mean what you say. It's a very, it's of all the things, if I give anyone advice who's an adult going into life, mm-hmm. say the most important thing, if you want advice, I'll give you this one thing, remember it, in all circumstances you'll be extremely successful in life. And that is, only say what you mean. Be sadiq mm-hmm. all the time. And so, these people who like to have a little joke and, you know, say like, oh, I put it up there, but really, they didn't put it up there, they're just trying to make, I don't know, that surely is a bit of a grey area. I mean, yeah, probably. well, the Prophet the, 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 pe- the people uh, talked about the people who, would, who don't uh, lie even joking. They have a mm-hmm. place in the highest places of Jannah. Mm-hmm. So this is of the, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's better to be that way. Mm-hmm. And if you train your children to be like that, then jazakillah khayra. And if you like that yourself, it's, you know, it's better to be that way. And all of this returns to one thing. All returns to that uswa hasana. The whole thing is there. The more you put it into practice, the more you will be loved by Allah. The more you're loved by Allah, you think, you're gonna have a, you think your life isn't going to turn out well? Of course your life is going to turn out well. You'll get more tests. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. Because you have more muscles for the test. Look at Sayyidina Ibrahim's test. What a test. He had to leave, abandon his wife and child. How many billions of people go there and repeat the very same actions of Sayyidina Ibrahim and Hajj and Sayyid? Billions of people repeating their actions and remembering them to this day until the end of time. Every single Nabi is from Sayyidina Ibrahim after Sayyidina Ibrahim. That's the result of his test. Because he had the Iman, Allah gave him the test because he was Sadiq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded him with a tremendous reward. So he's got the, he has the reward in the dunya and the reward in the akhirah. Allah blessed him and blessed his progeny. SubhanAllah. So we, even to this day, how many billions and billions and billions and billions of people to the day of the judgment will say on their salat countless times, Allahumma <coughs> salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Sayyidina Muhammad, kema salaita ala Sayyidina Ibrahim wa ala Sayyidina Ibrahim. SubhanAllah. So that's to, how many billions of people. So um, no pain, no gain, guys. Alhamdulillah, he doesn't know. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The sum of these lectures that I gave in Zawiya a year ago, a year and a half ago, expressing my concern that this model of tarbiyah that you are directly or indirectly following is un-Islamic. Because the values, the underlying values that it brings out, first of all, that the direct values it teaches the child, and then the character traits that it actually establishes in the children are un-Islamic. They're against the basic principles and objectives of Islam. So the basic principles and objectives of Islam, first of all, is slavehood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which requires submission. Someone who is self-oriented is not going to have submission. And is not going to be sacrificing, is not going to prefer others to themselves, and is not going to give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent me this book which confirmed this notion or sense that there was something very wrong here. There's something going wrong. Now, and I want to say, and I want to establish, make it very clear in everybody's mind, I do not believe in harsh raising of children. On the contrary, I believe that children should be raised with a great deal of love. However, there is no harm in giving them some physical discipline if they need it. A child who has been raised with clear limits and clear discipline 
does not need to be hit. They don't need to be hit. So I only have the realm of the zawiya to give tarbiya. I don't give much tarbiya outside of the zawiya, except if they're well-attended zawiya children. If they're zawiya children and their parents accept my authority, then I'll, I'll express that authority outside of the zawiya. There are many children in this zawiya who know the limit in the zawiya and they have never been hit and they will never be hit because they know what's expected from them and if they go over the limit a little bit, they just need to be told, you're doing something wrong, you know that's wrong and they stop. You don't have to hit them because they know the limits and they're going to cross them sometimes and they don't need to be hit when they cross them a little bit because they just need to be told so they come back. If they are belligerent, then they need to be hit because they know that's a limit. You don't go across the limit. You want to be belligerent, then you get discipline. You did it, you went accidentally or you went unconsciously over the limit, you just need to be told what to do because they know. Okay, this book talks about how excessive self-admiration and self-love and focus on self-esteem has become a Western value, a Western cultural value in raising children. I haven't actually finished all the book, but what I want to share with everyone that is of most significant is, the first section is the diagnosis, chapter one, the many wonders of admiring yourself. So are the Slavic. You could put it in Islamic terms, the many wonders of focusing on your great naps. That's what it means. The many wonders of you. Me, myself, and I, look how great I am. Look what I did. Look what I accomplished. Look what I said. That's what it's about. Admiring yourself. Wow. Look at me. Chapter 2, The Disease of Excessive Self-Admiration and the Top 5 Myths About Narcissism. Narcissism, love of self, and self-esteem and admiration. And one of them is, a big myth is, if you don't love yourself, you can't love anyone else. This is one of the myths. You can read about it. Isn't narcissism beneficial, especially in a competitive world? Challenging another myth about narcissism. How did we get here? Origins of the epidemic. So these are the first chapters. And I'm going to read a little bit from this chapter, The Origins of the Epidemic, because I want you to understand that this began somewhere. It wasn't there before. But now it's become so prevalent that people don't even distinguish it anymore, that it it wasn't there before. Because many of you grew up in a generation where it was prevalent in the society or it was beginning and it was common So you don't actually remember what it was like before that. Whereas I grew up in a generation where it wasn't like that. This big focus on the self and self-esteem was not there when I was in school and I was growing up. So the root causes of the epidemic, I photocopied this first chapter because it is immediately relative to all of us and why we are coming together. And I want everyone to please read it. It's called... Parenting, raising royalty. So what are they actually saying, you can find out for yourself, is that you're going to be producing a generation of people who are of no value even to themselves. Because they don't have any substance in their character. They're used to receiving without working. They're used to praise without accomplishment. They're used to thinking that they are entitled and that they deserve to receive. They're not used to giving and thinking about the needs of other people. I'm just going to read you some extracts from the chapter number four from the first section, which is, how did we get here? And you, anyone can uh, in the future borrow this book from me or that you can you know, get your own version. I have the, the first author, I haven't read it, she has another book which she wrote. This is co-authored with a, another psychologist. But she has another book, the first author, Jean Twenge, or however it's pronounced. It's called Generation Me. 
generation me. Or you could say in our Islamic terms, generation nafs. <laughs> That's what you're making. You have to understand that. You have to really look with insight what kind of person are you cultivating because the, the values that you are inculcating into these children at a very young age, that they are special, that what has happened here in this neighborhood, that an adult will reprimand a child and then the parent will come along in front of the adult and say, don't worry, Habibi. Thank you very much when, the, when I'll reprimand a child and I'll go to the mother and say, your child has done this. This is inappropriate. And the mother will say, thank you very much for your, uh, for your concern. And in front of the adult, tell the, ma the child, Malish Habibi, don't worry. It's okay. And, okay, what, are you, what, are you, what kind of seed are you implanting in that child's nest? That it doesn't have to respect anybody else. And that anything dislike that happens to it, he is the one who's entitled, not anybody else. So you have to look, what I'm asking you to do when you are raising these children, don't look immediately at what the child feels at that moment. Look at the seeds that you are inculcating in that child that are going to grow into a person with specific characteristics at some point in their life. And the, what uh, Sheikh Hassan, Sheikh Hassan, as we said, the basis that we took in the Sheikh Hassan lessons, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't given you a choice in how you raise your children. You are obliged, they are an amana, they don't belong to you, and you are obliged to bring forth sadihin people. So you have to inculcate in those little people the values that will cause them to be signing him when they grow up. And the other thing that he said that if we remember he had a whole lecture on it, if you love your children, the genuine proof of your love is that you're going to give them what benefits them in this world and the next. And that necessitates that you prevent them from some things that they want and that you force them to do some things that they dislike to do because otherwise they won't have they won't be Salihim people they won't have the character basis and the adab to be those kind of people so anyway we, we're, we're going to move on we have a number of things that we want to discuss today I have a, a discussion that we had not finished about children hitting each other which we want to cover today and I have a couple of other things that I needed to tell everybody. So uh, I just wanted to have a look a little bit at this chapter of how did we get here. Just picking a few things to read to you so that you can understand when things changed. What, was, what happened? First of all, I'll just read you a couple of things here. Uh, Self-admiration was not always a core American idea. A key element in solving the mystery of the narcissism epidemic is the value placed on self-admiration. This is the key of how this started. Not that long ago, self-admiration was not a core cultural value in the United States. If the 2007 NBC public service announcement saying, quote, everyone is born with their one true love themselves, end quote, had been broadcast during an episode of Leave it to Beaver in the 1950s, viewers would have been baffled and perhaps even disturbed. Today, however, there is very little shock expressed when children sing about how special they are in preschool or when a TV character parrots the mindless psycho babble that you have to love yourself before you can love someone else. Most people do not see what a truly radical departure this is from the past, either because they are too young to remember or because the change happened too slowly for them to notice. So, uh, and then it talked about what are some of the core American values, because this is an American book, and this disease has grown up in the American society. 
There is a, one thing to note. There's some of these books about self-admiration and self-esteem. They were originally written not for the general public, but for people who really lacked confidence because they came from a very abused childhood. So children of alcoholics, for example, they had to have some self-esteem in order to be able to get through life and get on their feet. But the general public did not need all of the self-esteem. So, some of, so looking at some of the core American values, individual freedom tempered with equality, but in a more self-sacrificing form, not in a self-focused form. Hold on here. I missed something here. Hold on. Missed the page. Equality is deeply ingrained. The ideal of the United States is a place of equality is deeply ingrained. Americans were famous for their can-do attitude and their persistence in chasing innovation. The current ethic of self-admiration, in contrast, declares that it is not necessary to do anything to be special or to like yourself. Okay, and then there's a quote here that uh, in relation to current cultural values, which instead focus more on admiring yourself, no matter how little effort you put in or however bad the result. The main thing is, oh, you're good no matter what you do, no matter what you achieve, no matter whether you achieve or you don't achieve, it's, you're still good. Okay, there is a thing of, okay, that failure, you don't want people to lose confidence. But one thing that is pointed out here is that research showed that people who were given this self-esteem after failing in exams, for example, did worse later on because they have no sense of having to accomplish anything. There's no, there's no sense of effort having need to be made to achieve accomplishment. So anyway... So if self-admiration wasn't there from the beginning, when did it become so central to American culture? Few people talked of self-admiration in the first half of the 20th century when the country was focused on overcoming two world wars and the Great Depression. And so just skipping that, for the most part, post-war America emphasized fitting in and getting things done rather than admiring yourself, so immediately after the wars. However, the change took place in the 19. 60s. So this is the, it was a change about a whole lot of values. It was a rebellion against the more stricter, we could say, constricting values of the 1950s. Because European and American Christian values of that era was often very unfeeling and very unemotional. So you'll find in Muslim women, I found that when I came out of New Zealand, because I, we lived there without our family, and uh, when I first went back to our family in, in Kosovo, I was very, uh, it had a, what's the word I want? I was kind of, not startled, but I was, uh, what's the word I want? It drew my attention how physical people were between each other, like woman between woman and with children. And, you know, people were a lot more expressive of the physically expressive, hey, this little creature, when she makes noise too much, she has to be removed. <laughs> so anyway, people were a lot more loving, emotional, expressive. Sorry? No, I, my family originally Albanians from Kosovo. So they're, they're, they're Muslim peoples and they're Eastern peoples in their culture. And where I was raised, it's very British culture. So, you know, to put your hand on, on someone of the same sex, it's like, Danny, what are you doing? Danny, don't touch me. Or if you saw two men holding hands in the street or putting their arms in each other's arms, you think there's something weird about these guys. Or someone, you know, a guy, you know, walking along with his arm over the shoulder of his friend. So, uh, whereas in, in Muslim culture, that's very normal to express physical love towards uh, people that you love of the same sex. So, uh, a lot of these things that developed in the 1960s and into the 70s were actually a what we call rad al fal, and it's a reverse reaction to uh, cultural practices that were not really natural. Not, not they were rigid and constrictive. But 
the problem is we often throw the baby out with the bathwater. Okay, so I just want to read. Here's the 1960s, what happened. Although many remember the 60s, this, I'm just taking little selected passages out of this. We're not reading the whole book. Although many remember the 60s as a narcissistic era of hippies and drug use, the culture of the time, both in liberal movements and in Nixon's conservative silent majority, was highly collective and group orientated. There was a lot of self-exploration, but it was usually done in group context. It wasn't as individual, uh, individually orientated as it is in our time. One part of the 1960s did eventually transform into a source of self-admiration the human potential movement. This movement didn't start out as a way to promote self-admiration, but its emphasis on introspection and self-improvement morphed over the years into a focus on self-admiration. Uh, I read this whole chapter, even though it has a number of details in it, but it's kind of essential to us. In 1960, author Adolf Huxley, best known for writing Brave New World and The Doors of Perception, I remember everyone was reading these books you know, back in the late 70s and still in the early 80s, uh, began to hold seminars at the Esalen, whatever it's pronounced, institute in Big Sur, California, which centered on psychologist Abraham Maslow's idea of self-actualization, originally defined as the experience of reaching one's full potential, being all that one can be. Okay, this concept in itself is not narcissistic. Self-actualization includes sharing one's sympathy and benevolence with many people. Maslow placed self-actualization at the top of his famous hierarchy of human needs and described it as very difficult to achieve. Maslow could identify only a few people who were actually truly self-actualized. Maslow also included self-esteem as an essential need in his hierarchy, one rung below self-actualization and much easier for most people to achieve. In short, self-actualization is tough, self-esteem is relatively easy. Thus, as the human potential movement evolved through the 1960s and into the 1970s, the more difficult concept of self-actualization was eclipsed by the easier concept of self-esteem. Today, self-actualization is very rarely discussed, but self-esteem appears in magazine articles, children's television, and numerous books. Thousands of books and articles and television programs yearly. She actually has a number of them. It's like 40,000 or something, you know. Anyway, this went into the 1970s, and they, most of these uh, analysts are saying that something changed in the 1970s because merging out of the 1970s into the 1980s, narcissism actually became a psychological disease, and many people were starting to be treated for it. The too much self-centeredness. Because it went from a group movement in the 1960s to an individual level in the 1970s. It says, by the 1970s, the communal goals of the 1960s had dissipated and only the gaudy, empty shell of self-focus remained. Okay, let's have a look at a couple of these quotations. Three social trends seem to be the main culprits. Let's listen to these social trends. The first catalyst was the movement toward self-esteem, which began with good intentions. Wouldn't it be great if people felt good about themselves all the time? If you don't have any pain or discomfort in your life, you don't have any real introspection. You don't actually find out about yourself. And you can be stuck with a lot of bad qualities if you're never challenged. So... Nathal Brandon's first book, The Psychology of Self-Esteem, published in 1969, got the ball rolling. Brandon declares that loving yourself is crucial. 
Quote, there is no value judgment more important to man, no factor more decisive in his psychological development and motivation than the estimate he passes on himself. So contrary to Islam. The whole value that you have is in the estimation you place on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. And your whole achievement is your slavehood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the emulation that you have in your life of the Prophet alayhi wasalam, the role model for all of humanity until the end of time. So that's the criteria, not on how much you love yourself. You don't need to love yourself at all. You can have a lot of goodness and khayr in your life without having any focus on yourself. On the contrary. And this doesn't mean, there's no, lack of focus on the self does not mean that one hates oneself. It's not the opposite. But it's rather there's a selflessness because there is a, a, an awareness of things that are greater. And the greatest selflessness occurs with the realization of the immensity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so rather a person has a great deal more value and has a great deal more happiness and significance and fullness in their life when there is a lot less of this me, myself and I, me, myself and I, me, myself and I going on all the time. Okay. Uh, the nature of the, his self-evaluation, he's quoting from this author, has profound effects on a man's thinking processes, emotions, desires, values, and goals. It works, as we said, and this is what I just instinctively understood that I was trying to convey in the lectures that I gave in Zawiya, and that is this works for a civilization where family and religion no longer exist. You exist as an individual. You do not have strong family bonds. You don't live with your parents. Your parents don't live with you. You may not even have any siblings. You may have one or two and they're scattered over in different places of the world. You call them a couple of times a year. They're not in the orbit of your life. So people live as individuals. Totally. It's a civilization of individuals. And the more you competitive you are and the more you are able to knock everyone down for yourself, for your self-accomplishment, the better you're going to do in that civilization. But it's totally contrary to the objectives of Islam. Okay. It is the single most significant uh, key to his behavior. Of course, you know, if you're everything is about yourself, of course it's going to have an incredible effect on his behavior. Uh, and anyway, end quote. And the author here says, our author of this book, as you know from the earlier chapters, little of this is true. You don't have to love yourself to be successful in life. However, research on self-esteem was in its infancy then, so Brandon's claims were plausible given what was known at the time. The problem is that no one went back and revised the cultural script once research showed that self-esteem wasn't that important after all. So here, just skipping a number of uh, um, things, it said, uh, says that by the 70s, the 60s goal of the self-exploration had begun to transition naturally into the goal of self-expression, in many ways the theme of our current age expressing oneself and so anyone who was in that era can remember that you know the focus going out of the focus of family and responsibilities towards other people and to the larger community the focus went on to discovering the wondrous things about your own self self-expression however is much easier so it's talking here uh um skipping a few things that how some of the self-exploration uh, in, involves some discipline and some deep discomfort sometimes. Skipping that, we go to self-expression, however, is much easier to do. All you have to do is talk about yourself, draw attention to yourself, and sometimes promote yourself. Okay, after we've read this, everyone, please read this article about parenting. 
and understand where did it come from. It's not from Islam. Okay. At the same time that the interest in self-esteem and self-expression ramped up, the culture began to move away from community-oriented thinking. Now, just we'll read a couple of these things here. It might be interesting. As Robert Putman showed in his bestseller, Bowling Alone, <laughs> memberships in groups such as Kiwanas, the PTA, and even bowling leagues began to decline in the 70s. Personal relationships showed similar trends. The divorce rate skyrocketed. Young people began to marry later, and the birth rate plummeted. Because it's all about enjoying your life and enjoying yourself. Singles culture, practically non-existent in the 1950s and 60s, was all the rage, with singles-only apartment complexes springing up and disco rooms full of gold chain-wearing bachelors and young bachelorettes trying not to sprain their ankles dancing to staying alive in four-inch platform heels. Okay, that doesn't, it's not directly related to us as Muslims, but a lot of us grew up in that culture. And so a lot of those values, whether you liked it or not, you got hit by that, those values. The splash of that went over onto, uh, because a lot of your values have come out of that culture. And a lot of the way you're raising your children comes out of that culture, whether you realize it or not. Okay, we're just going to, I think we're going to, just read this uh, one little last paragraph. A few other authors have also pegged the roots of the narcissism epidemic to the 1970s, which gives us further confidence in the date. In 1976, Tom Wolfe accurately labeled a decade that was only half over with his groundbreaking New York Magazine article, The Me Decade and the Third Great Awakening. Wolf argued that Americans abandoned the vision of themselves as part of an interconnected social system, which is how Muslims live. They still live that way. They live in families. They live in communities. They live in clans. They still live in tribes in many places. Uh, a connection of parents to children and grandchildren and of community to community and instead turn to the narcissist pursuit of the self as a source of value, almost like a religious experience. SubhanAllah. The quest for the self is in some ways the misguided quest for the divine spark within. And we don't say the divine spark within, but we say the ruh that exists within everyone's soul, that within everyone's self, that is uh, whose native lands is the uh, love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the remembrance of him. So the ruh naturally longs for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you take that factor out of your existence, then there's going to be a vacuum. And so that vacuum in Western civilization is now filled with me. How great I am. So uh, it talks about a number of the things that accentuate this problem. The first chapter is parenting. Second chapter is the celebrity culture. And then it goes on to talk about things like Facebook and MySpace. And it's like an amazing thing. You know, people spend a lot of time promoting themselves. It's like, what have you got to say that is of any value? It's like, why would you bother saying anything? Say, so what is it? What's the accomplishment that you have to? You know, even the word blog, it sounds like it's content. Blog. It's like junk. It's like the word bog. You know, if you blog, you get bogged. Anyway, Alhamdulillah Rabbil I mean, these are the articles. So it's just to keep in mind, everyone, keep in mind. This is uh, this person who wrote this. We know that they are a non-Muslim, but we are benefiting from their knowledge. And but uh, at the same time, we're not. We're, with all books that are going to be written by non-Muslims, 
we're not going to take the whole thing log, stock and barrel because they don't have the same belief that we do and the same values. But there are observations here that are of benefit to us as Muslims. So at uh, the Prophet, he said, Al-Hikmah Dalatul Mu'man. The procedure of our lessons are that one week we do a lecture with Sheikh Hassan and two weeks later we have a discussion, a practical discussion. So we're actually going to have a practical discussion today. However, I spoke to Sheikh Hassan yesterday. So uh, he asked me for some feedback on the, on the classes. I did mention that some of the social issues that are mentioned are not relevant to us because they're related to Syrian or Damascan culture. And I said we took three lessons as our base that children don't belong to one, they are an amana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and one has to realize that one has a tremendous responsibility in raising those children, and have, one has to do so in a way that brings about the result that is pleasing to Allah. And love of one's children, what it means in a genuine sense, and also the importance and significance of a happy, stable home life in which to raise the children as the base of the life of the children. So a unhappy home life does not bring about good children. Uh, even if you are working hard at making them pray and uh, having them memorize the Quran and teaching things about Islam, but the home life is not happy, they won't believe you. They won't believe you. And as we mentioned, there are a number of reasons for that. I mentioned some of them that, you know, parents fighting all the time. One of the parents, for example, not having acceptance of the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and always being in an unhappy state. Overemphasis on the children and neglecting the husband is a very big reason for an unhappy family. It makes things lopsided. And other reasons is not having qana, not having rida with your risk. So if you're always thinking, oh, I need more, I need more, I need more, I need more, and not having satisfaction in what you have, it's a reason to have an unhappy life. Or another reason is a lot of debt, extending yourself beyond your means. So that it's a burden that uh, causes a bother to the whole family. So there are no, anything that disturbs an underlying factor, that disturbs the uh, tranquility of that family's life, it has to be fixed up and removed. It has to be fixed up and removed. And so one should... Uh, uh, investigate to see what might be a reason. Anyway, just before we get on to our practical discussion, there's a sister, a sister in California, who uh, wrote this little article, and there, she, every time she saw met people for the last 12 years, uh, she's been raising her, her name is uh, uh, Hina, I don't know what's her, Hina Mukhtar in California. So she has, uh, I got this uh, article written by her that for the last 12 years, as she's been raising her own children, any time she saw someone, met someone who had uh, religious children, well-raised Muslim children, she asked them what was their uh, secret of their success, so to speak. So she found that after asking many, many, many people that there were 10 points that kept on reoccurring. And some of these points are points that Sheikh Hassan has actually mentioned also. So uh, I thought it might be, uh, you can get this article off the internet, you can contact her if you want, you can get the address. And uh, But I thought it might be interesting to actually just quickly go over those 10 points to see the, the 10 frequent, most frequent uh, things that were were uh, uh, repeated from amongst all of those people. So number one was lots of dua, and that was what Sheikh Hassan mentioned. That if you want to have Salihin children, even before you get married, you should make lots of dua. Subhanallah. So all of them said that we made lots of dua to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and this is where it all begins. It all begins. Your whole success in your life is understanding your ubudiyya to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more ubudiyya you have to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more success that you will have in your life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of success. 
and you're asking him for help and insight into the best way to raise your children, inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you that insight and will give you that help. So the first was dua. The second was suhba, good, uh, good friends. And that is for the children from their own friends and also adult, uh, the adult company of the children. So how many, um, how many people remarked that how deeply their children were affected by a teacher or an older role model? And that's the advantage that many people of you here have that you underestimate. The effect on the hearts of your children of the older people that they intermix with. There, there may be events and uh, not just, uh, uh, you know, this is one of the things that we're emphasizing in the homeschooling. I'm working with Saidiya in the homeschooling. Our school is called Fatua, you know, chivalry school. Sheikh Mugab is the name. So, but that's what we want to achieve. Or we're looking to achieve the, uh, uh, raising good Muslims with good akhlaq and this Fatua of preferring others to themselves, preferring Allah to themselves and the Ummah to themselves. So it's the people who have preferred Allah and His Prophet والسلام, and this Ummah to, the, to themselves are the ones who brought us Islam. And we're the, they're the reason we're Muslim. So uh, one of the things that we are looking at is to make sure that as the children are getting older now when they're coming into the homeschooling that the teachers represent role models for them that every one of them everyone is a different personality but every one of them is uh, manifests uh, love of Allah wa rasuluhu and taqwa Allah and personal khuluk that there is every one of them has their own way of expressing that but that none of them are without that so that the children this is consolidated in their very souls all the time. It's always been consolidated in their souls that the point of their life is Allah. So the third uh, point is love of the Prophet Love of emulation of the Prophet and being tied to the seerah of the Prophet Point number four was that the children are given opportunities to have a lot of fun without there being haram. So that you eliminate the haram out of their lives, but let them have opportunities to enjoy themselves as children. So, you know, like with their bicycles and their swimming and their trips and, you know, whatever it is that they're doing, playing in the dirt, you know. And here's number five. This is one of the things very much emphasized by Sheikh Hassan, that you have to be, uh, what is, how does uh, she say it here? Our parents didn't just talk the talk they walk the walk. So you have to, if you want to have Salihin children, you have to be Salih. There's nothing worse for a child than to be told to do something and they see that the person telling them to do it doesn't do it themselves. Whatever you want your children to be, you have to be it. If you're not going to be it, don't expect them to be it. Uh, number six, uh, here the title is, I wasn't afraid to be the bad guy. I would say, I wasn't afraid to give them some discipline. So the parents who were successful, they established limits with their children. And as one person describing their mother, they said, my mother wasn't, when we used to come home from, when we were at school and out, and if she found out there was something going on that she thought was inappropriate, she wasn't afraid to rock the boat. She would capsize it. So whereas a lot of the parents, a number of the parents mentioned that are like, oh, I'm, they're afraid to intimidate their children. Oh, they're intimidated to set limits for their children, to say no and to enforce discipline on things that are, should be strict limits. Yeah. I'm going to give you a good example in this culture, in the Jordanian culture. When I see 12 and 13 year old girls in this culture who don't wear a hijab and I tell their parents, your daughter is now attractive to men. She should be wearing a hijab. And they will say to me, 
she's so, she's still young. I don't want to force her. I don't want to force her so that she doesn't like the hijab thing. I said, don't tell me that. Because if your daughter wanted to go out after Maghrib to her friends or to do something, or she was talking to a boy that's older, you would put down that limit with some real force because that is a limit that you see as something that cannot be crossed. I said, if she wanted to wear shorts outside, you wouldn't let her. Is that right? And they say, yes. This is why. Because that's a limit, as far as you are concerned, is wrong. So you're intimidated to make her do something she doesn't want to do because you are not enforcing that value. You haven't established that as a value that is important in yourself. You're giving her the ability to make a choice in something but that she doesn't want to do that is, is not your choice. It's Allah's choice. And he has not given you a choice in this. So, meaning, what I want to say is that a lot of parents will feel intimidated to place a limit on something, but they're not intimidated to put limits on other things. So why don't you just make a criteria for yourself that's very clean and clear? Qala Allah wa Rasul. Allah and His Prophet. Take the limit of what Allah and His Prophet have said. Don't tell me I don't want to uh, force her. I'm afraid that she will have a reverse reaction. The, the thing is, okay, if you live in a Western society, someone will say to me, hey, but you know, you're living over here in Jordan. You're in a Muslim community. You can enforce these things. But we're living in the West. And it's a lot harder out there, and the children have a lot more options. Allahu alam, yes, I understand what you're saying. However, I'm a big believer, and if you give your children a lot of love and, and care and attention, and you are a role model yourself, and you don't make exceptions for yourself, your children will follow you loyally in what you have uh, chosen, and they will keep the limits that you give to them. That's generally the case. When children have a very happy and loving life with their families, they're very loyal to their parents. How do you have people who are Mormons, for goodness sake, and Quakers and, you know, Brooklyn Jews, you know, with their ringlets and whatnot in their hair? And there's this bottle, but their children follow them. They have a devotion to what their parents are devoted to. Because children are naturally loyal to their parents. And that is the significance and importance of a happy family home. Because your children will not be loyal to you if you and your husband are fighting all the time. So when you get your nafs, you let your nafs have the upper hand, and you, know, you get that nasty last word in, you're destroying your home. You're destroying the, the hope of your children. So you have to work at having a happy home in order to have a successful family. It's the core of a successful family. Even a Bato religion, they will succeed in making their children follow them if they have a happy home. But people of Haq will not succeed. It's very unlikely that they will succeed in their children following them if they have a miserable home. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the end of the day also, uh, you know, it is uh, guidance is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Correct, tarbiyah is a sabab, it's a cause, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also shows us throughout history, even with the MBR, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as an example to us, how he brings the living out of the dead and the dead out of the living. So you'll find, you know, his, one of the greatest women in human history was Azia, the wife of Pharaoh. And the, uh, of the worst woman in human history was the wife of Lut. As mentioned in the Quran, as one of the people who betrayed their husband, the wife of Lut, alayhi salam. And there have been children who have been, uh, Akram ibn Abi Jahl was one of the shuhada of the Marika of Yarmouk. And uh, some of the children of the India, like Sayyidina Nuh, were not of the Salihin. So the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives guidance so you know we 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 are hum we should be humble 
and, uh, and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his tawfiq and his forgiveness and that he overlooks our faults and completes our aspiration from his mercy towards us. Because it, at the end of the day, it's his guidance that brings, uh, it's his giving of guidance that brings that about. But of the causes and effects uh, that work in the world, correct tarbiyah is a major reason for success in your children being salihin. Number eight, sorry, number seven, was that they, uh, over across the board, I always kept them close by, that the parents, especially this is in North America, that they didn't allow across the board, these people never allowed their children to stay the night at someone else's house. And if they sent them, if they were, the children went on trips, they had to go in the company of their parents. They didn't, they didn't go unaccompanied. I would make an exception if, and for example, people here that have lived very close to each other and the children have virtually grown up as siblings towards one another. It's different than if you're going with someone from a friend from another town, for example, that haven't grown up with so much closeness. Number eight, we didn't spoil our kids, nor did we praise them too much, because this is the thing of the overinflating of the nafs. It's not good for the character development of the children. Uh, number nine, talk to your kids. There's two kinds of talking to children as far as I can see. And there's the one that children are not communicated, and so the children have little broken hearts because they're not communicated with. Then there is the over talking where you have to explain, you know, it's like like, you know, two year olds, three year olds do not need a detailed explanation of everything that is happening. Now we're going to do this. You have to let me do this because I need to do this, because I need to do this, because I need to do this. Children don't need that. But there is a, a, an aspect of talking to children that, you have, that I think is important to understand is that children are little people and they have little hearts. And they need to be able to tell me what's in their little heart sometimes. And they need to, they want to understand things. So they have to learn what is appropriate talk and the appropriate way to talk so that they have correct adam. And they're not always blabbering and cutting out everyone else's conversation. And they're not the focus of attention. But they have to be also know, they also have to know that when they talk to older people, whether their parents or their uh, uncles or aunts or their grandparents or the uh, friends of their parents, that if they ask a question, that they're answered seriously and that they can inquire about the world and find out about things or if they feel hurt in some way, that they can express themselves. So even though they're little, they still need to be respected too as little people, but they don't need to be over-respected. And the last point was uh, they had a pious father who engaged them that uh, was uh, across the board that uh, children who's had a father that was involved even uh, at a little bit of a distance, not on the day-to-day -day basis like the mother, it had a very, very deep impact on the children. And uh, just to remind everyone, Yanni, if you, if you don't have a husband who's involved with your children, it's very important to think about, well, what's going on in your marriage? So you might want to make some inquiries in, you know, in looking into how to uh, improving your marriage because a, a happy marriage and a loving marriage, the uh, husband, where the husband feels loved and respected and appreciated, he generally does like very much to reciprocate with involvement in the family as much as he's able. So if the husband is, being, is withdrawing from the family, and hanging out with his friends and not participating, then it means that he is feeling there's something, he's not feeling appreciated or wanted in that family. There's something that he's not getting in his home, and so he's trying to get it from outside. Okay, this is from the, um, uh, okay, shall I, keep, you know, do you mind me reading your question? No, okay. Uh, I have perceived a, a situation among the children in the hay that has caused me some concern, and I wish to bring it to your attention, and I seek your advice and guidance in this issue. What I have seen is the children can quickly resort to physical aggression, sometimes quite violent, other times just smacks or shoves. Okay. When speaking with some of the parents, I found that the encouragement to hit or fight has sometimes come from the parents themselves, especially of boys. 
that they should know how to hold their own or defend themselves or command respect. Uh, it worries me that these directors are sometimes in relation to their friends or to the other children of Morids. Myself, I am not comfortable telling my child to hit any other kid, no matter the harm that has come to him. Even if he is being hit, he could easily get away and not return the blows. It reminds me of the Hadith, there is no harm or reciprocating harm, or the words of Sayyidina Habil, even if you raise your hand to kill me, I will not fight back, for I fear Allah, the Lord of the worlds. I would really like to know your perspective on it. Do you believe that our children should fight if they are being bullied, teased, or pestered? What would you consider grounds for using violence? Is it from the adab of the awliya to ever resort to violence? The first answer, we have one from Sheikh Hassan, we have one from Sheikh Ahmed, and just as a matter of interest, uh, Abu Munir, who's, uh, he's not an alim, but you know, he's a father of seven kids and three boys and growing up in Damascus, and so we'll see what, uh, I'll, I'll let you know what he said also. <laughs> so the first one, Sheikh Hassan, with my, no, don't speak any perfect Arabic here, but it's an Sheikh Hassan. Yejib rad al daf'an an al لكن لا يجب التعدي الحد أو تفريغ طاقة الغضب بأذية أخي المسلم بل يجب أن يكون هناك نوع من التسامح, التسامح وهذا التسامح ليس دليلا على الضعف بل هذه معاني دينية يجب أن تغرس في نفس الطفل تمام. So what did Sheikh Hassan say? He said it is wajib to uh, to prevent the aggression, to stop the aggression. Uh, or, uh, it's not meant that you have to return it, yeah. you have to stop it. Yeah. Right. Now, uh, in self-defense. So the, the, the child has to learn to prevent people's aggression towards them in order to uh, defend itself. لكن لا يجب تعدي الحد أو تفريغ الطاقة طاقة الغضب بأذية أخي المسلم. However, it is not essential to go beyond the limits necessary to stop the aggression by or to to allow one's complete anger to take over and to to release all of one's anger against the person who's shown aggression aggression to one by causing harm to one's brother. بل يجب أن يكون هناك نوع من التسامح. There has to be there uh, uh, some degree of uh, pardoning from the person who's been shown the aggression. And وهذا التسامح ليس دليلا على الضعف. And then and knowing how to pardon other people and forgive them is not uh, is not a doesn't mean that the other person is weak. Doesn't mean that the that the, the child who's learning to forgive. Is, is weak because he's doing that. Okay. بل هذه المعاني دينية يجب أن تغرس في نفس الطفل. Rather, these are uh, religious meanings you know, that have to be, you know, forgiving and pardoning other people, that have to be تغرس, uh, يعني that have to be deeply grounded in the nafs of the child. And this is what we mean that what we're trying to say is watch what you're doing with your children because everything that you're telling them or not telling them by the way you act is confirming to them the way they should behave. So when you are, when you are uh, 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 giving them tarbiyah, you are establishing something that's going to be there when they grow up. So if you're going to make it, if you if you have this thing like you know one of the things that kind of drives Mishwe crazy is kids that have tantrums. This drives me nuts. It's like you tell some kid, please sit down. He goes no. <laughs> it's or like, you know, like someone comes and talks to me. This happened more than one time. One any specific person is not meant here. This has happened several times. The mother will come. She'll talk, be talking to me. And the children are not used to sitting down and being quiet. And so we tell the, mo- the mother, I'll tell the child myself, I say, sit down, I'm talking to your mother. And they cannot be quiet. And then they say, I want this, I want that, I want to go here, I want to go there, I want to do this, I want to do that. 
and they start throwing a tantrum because they're suddenly confined to a circumstance where they can't get what they want. And they're very badly behaved. So, so if you're going to have a, a child that when they want something, they demand something, you give it to them, that's the way they're going to carry on growing up. They learn from you. You have trained them. If you don't receive what you want and you throw a tantrum, you will receive it. I was a, some little kid came and sat on my step out there and there was no one there and I couldn't go inside because I was afraid this kid would go down, fall down the stairs. So I said, you have to go outside. And they said, no. I was shocked. <laughs> so they, what do you mean no? So then I have to start getting mean because I make it afraid. And so another little guy came in who was a little bit older and I said, you Get up now, you have to go outside. So the older one got a bit afraid. Just because she was afraid, she moved. Otherwise, she wouldn't have. And then the younger one is still, nah! And the mother came in. I said, your child doesn't listen. And it's like, your child doesn't listen. And they, they, they just ignored me and didn't want to hear it and took the child out. It's like, isn't that a problem? Your child doesn't listen. Why doesn't your child listen? You have a problem if you tell your child or someone tells your child, you know, it's some, three years old. A child understands at three years old. Why is it that your child at three years old doesn't understand you have to go out from here? It's a problem. You have a problem in your tarbiyah because you've taught your child does not have to obey. You don't think that's important. That's up to you. But you've got a problem. Because it's ingrained in that child now that he doesn't have to listen to you. When do you think he's going to start listening? When he's five, he's going to be the same. When he's seven, he's going to be the same. When he's nine, he's going to be the same. Why would he change? What's happened that's new? You've ingrained something deep into that soul. You've given him a pattern of behavior. So he knows when you say something, You've shown the child, when I say something, I don't mean it. Nothing's going to happen if you don't listen to me. And then what happens is that you get to a point where you have to tell the child five times. And when you tell them five times, then you get so frustrated, you'll do something about it. Child now has it established. He's learning from you. Five, if I'm told the fifth time, then I must do something. So he waits every time you tell him to time number five. Because it's time number five means I must follow. But before that, one, two, three, four, I don't need to follow. So that's, he's, that's established pattern. He's looking, he's looking to you for his cues about how to respond. So you've taught him. So if you have a child, as far as I'm concerned, who doesn't listen... You have raised him badly. You've given him a bad habit. You haven't given him good tarbiyah. You've made his life hard. And you've made your own life hard. Okay. So, so what did, uh, uh, so this is the thing that, that these, whatever you teach your children is deeply established in the nafus. And so, those things that you keep repeating to your children become go in deeper and deeper into the inner force. So these so he's saying that teaching them to pardon other people is a, is a, one of the meanings and principles of Islam that should be established in the nafs. This is uh, uh, what did uh, Abu Munir just from a practical point of view of someone raising his own kids. What did he say? He said his his one he, his boys. How did he teach his boys? He said uh, to begin with you teach them to fight back. So that they know that they can, so they can defend themselves. And then when they, when they feel confident and that they can defend themselves, then you teach them to pardon other people. Yeah. So, so that the first step is that they, they, they don't become uh, wimpy and, and uh, uh, un, uh, uh, cowardly 
and afraid, so they learn to to stand up for themselves. Because children are, are children can be a little bit cruel when they play with each other. You know, they they haven't learnt adab and akhlaq yet. They're just a little wild and force. Yes. Do you think that if you were, you know, following that example, would you tell your child? I'm teaching you now, I want you now to fight back and learn to defend yourself, but I want you to know from the very beginning that later on I'm going to be asking you to show pardon, do you mean? It depends or, on how old the child is and how much they can understand. If I had a little kid around two or three years old, what I would probably do, I mean, I'm just... Because I'm just speaking from common sense, because I don't have this. I don't have the practical little uh, observations on the ground, because I haven't raised small children from beginning to end. But just from common sense, what I would do is I'd tell my little kitty, if someone hits you, you push them away. You push them away. Okay. And but uh, and so and don't let people hit you. You push them away. And so instead of teaching them to hit back, I'd tell them to push the harm away from themselves. And, but if I saw my children being aggressive to other kids, I'd give them an aggression they wouldn't forget. Because <laughs> they have to learn that they do not have a prerogative to hit other children. They're not allowed to hit and bite and slap and, you know, if they can hit other kids, I'd give them a good smacker with my spatula on their hands or on their butt that hurt and tell them you can't hit other children can't hit other children. So they learn from a very young age, they're not allowed to hit other children, but they have to be able to defend themselves. So when they get older, uh, you know, when they're around, I would assume around five, six years old, then you tell them if smaller children hit you, you know, two and three year olds, you just keep your hand out there and don't hit them back. They're small, they don't have little, proper little akal, and so don't hit them back, and so you forgive them, and because you know. So, and as they get older, uh, I would, I would, uh, I would. I think it's very good for boys uh, to learn uh, martial arts, and really, it's very good. My nephews, uh, uh, they're 16 and 17 now, and so they've always done martial arts. So they they have a lot of confidence about themselves and their ability to defend themselves. So they, you know, they they they're strong. You know, they're strong young men, and uh, and they you know, if they have to, they can beat somebody up. But they they're not encouraged to beat anybody up. But they they're having that sense of confidence about themselves that they do have physical strength, and uh, and can defend themselves if it's necessary. And you teach them to not accept to be abused and to have self-respect, but not to retaliate by going down onto a low level with other uh, people anyway. So um, we have another quote from Sheikh Ahmed al-Jamal, he's uh, also a Syrian scholar here in Jordan. يجب رد الادوان لأن الله تعالى قال نعم ممكن نعم So the translation of that ayah is whoever, just a loose translation, may Allah forgive me of any incorrectness, if someone shows aggression towards you, then show aggression towards them with the likes of what the aggression that has been shown towards you. So not extra. Okay. So then what did he say? Samahu adwan wa inkana min bab al-difa' an al-nafs min bab al-mashakila. Al-tifal ghayru al-balig la yistatiya an yistawab mana al-tisamah. Tisamah. In this ayah, Allah SWT says to show aggression back because it's a type of balaga called mushakala. Where, uh, and, uh, whereas what is meant is to defend yourself. That's what is meant to defend yourself. Said a, a child who is not a tifal, غير البارغ لا يستطيع أن يستوب معنى التسامح. كما أنه لا يستطيع أن يفرق بين التسامح وبين الضعف والخنوع. Okay, humiliation. It says that a child who is not balik, hasn't yet become balik, is not able to understand the full meaning of pardoning another. And uh, as just as he's not able to understand, the, to differentiate between pardoning someone 
and then uh, or the difference between forgiving someone and being weak and humiliated. So if he, because in a little child's mind, you know, someone, some guy comes and bullies him and he's, he has to say, uh, I forgive you. But at the same time, his natural instinct of his nafs is that he's being humiliated. So he won't be able to differentiate between not retaliating and being humiliated. So what did he say then? Uh, uh, so if we order him to be aggressive back, he could go beyond the limits. No. And if we tell him to forgive, then he could become uh, he could become used to being cowardly and weak. Now, ولذلك يصعب الإجابة على هذا السؤال. For this reason, it's very difficult to answer this question. فالأمر يختلف من ولد إلى ولد ومن جانب إلى جانب ويجب مراعاة كل الظروف. And he said, for this reason, you know, these are very you know intelligent answers, and and this is why we go back to Ahl al-Alam, go back to the people of knowledge for uh, our answers. He said, so, وَلِذَلَكْ يَسْعَبَ الْإِجَابَ عَلَى هَذَا السُوَالَ For this reason, the uh, answer to this question is very difficult because the matter for Amr يَخْتَلَفْ مِنْ وَلَدِ الْوَلَدِ Because the matter differs from child to child. Matter differs from child to child. Uh, because you have, might have a child who is by nature very strong and confident. نعم في في so here's a, uh, so this is why we like to discuss these matters in a group because we get the experience of the different parents. So um, Muhammad is saying here that, that there are some children who insist on hitting. So if like you, you sort of push them off one time, two times, they won't give up. They want to beat the other kid up. So in that case, you have to give them a good beating up once at least because the other child won't learn. As I, and, and this is Abu Munir's uh, position also, that you teach the child to defend itself so that it, it doesn't learn to be cowardly. So you take it by step by step or situation. And khutwa khutwa aw mawkaf mawkaf kima yukul shik ahmad. And he has it. If there's a walid, yani haqiqatan mu'zi. Al-afdal in nindarab. Yeah, we'll stop now. Yani nahna nawakaf huna. فالحمد لله أخذنا آآ آآ هذا آآ مبادي آآ آآ عديدة و يعني و و والحمد لله رب العالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم Before we begin today's درس I want to remind uh, ourselves that the whole basis of this dars is around the uh, saying of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam madar darsana hawla qawl al nabiya alayhi salatu wa salam la yu'minu ahadakum hatta akun ahab ilayhi min walidihi wa walidihi wa nasi ajma'in that none of you believe until I'm more beloved to him than his father or his son or all people entirely. Mm -hmm. So someone who has problems with this, they are still a mu'min, but they don't have kamal al -iman. And this is the kamal al -iman, or the perfection of and completeness of one's iman. 
So why we are doing this dance for Seva National Kaimi Bihari Dance is that we make our priorities the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet and obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet and preferring and submitting to what has come to us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet. And so the reason for this does is because we are seeing values and character traits that in the tarbiyah of the children that is not part of this preferring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet and his religion over other things or anything else. I would like to also just recite this ayah to you because we've done this in the other darses but we want to be able to backtrack periodically so that we can put things together and make our links so we're, we're always going back to the core of what we're trying to do going back to the heart of the matter أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ آبَاءُكُمْ وَأَبْنَاءُكُمْ وَأَخْوَانُكُمْ وَأَزْوَاجُكُمْ وَأَشِيرَتُكُمْ وَأَمْوَالٌ اقْتَرَفْتُمُوهَا وَتِجَارَةٌ تَخْشَوْنَهَا تَخْشَوْنَ كَسَادَهَا وَمَسَاكِنُ تَرْضَوْنَهَا أَحَبَّ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَجِهَادٍ فِي سَبِيلِهِ وجهاد في سبيله فتربصوا حتى يأتي الله بأمره والله لا يهتد قوم الفاسقين. so this ayah is a basis for not only the tarbiya of these children but it should be the basis of our whole entire life. okay what does this ayah say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet to say, and often when we have qul in the beginning of an ayah, it's to draw our attention that this is an important matter. If your fathers and your sons and your brothers and your wives and your clans or your kinsmen and the wealth that you have gathered and the trade that you're afraid will collapse and your homes that you enjoy are more beloved to you than Allah and his messenger and jihad in his way then wait in anticipation until Allah comes with his matter and Allah does not guide a people who are corrupt so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't accept from us that we prefer this life and what it is in it over himself and his prophet now so our effort in our personal lives and the tarbiyah that we hope to be uh, achieving here is to have our own submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet at every level possible in our lives. Today's dars uh, 